Newman, please sit down. I would like to welcome everyone here this evening to this meeting of Newcastle City Council and especially extend a warm welcome to members of Newcastle City Youth Council and the students in Newcastle Forum. I have a sponsorship uh, form going around. This is for uh, a, a Chief Executive Officer's Sleep Out, which will be held at uh, St. James's Park on Thursday, the 9th of October, and I will be taking part. This is a regional event bringing senior business people together in the city where they work. By giving up just one night of comfort, they will raise awareness of homelessness issues and generate vital funds to support town size most needy. Funds raised on the night will support a range of local charities that tackle homelessness issues, including our partner charities, Changing Lives and Newcastle United Foundation Funds and the People's Kitchen. Newcastle United Foundation and the People's Kitchen are two of my charities, and I would be um, obliged, and thank you, if you um, sign the sponsorship form. Apologies. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We've had apologies from councillors Ahad, Bell, Breaky, Huddard, Lawson, Sharon Patterson, Rahman and Stockdale. Thank you. Item two, Minister's Does Council agree the minutes of the meeting of the meeting of the Council held on the 2nd of July 2014? Mr. Stevenson. on reading the minutes um, the bullet point on page 7.4 at the top should read in my amendment that the resident survey in 2012 conducted by Ipsos Mori shows that 76% of residents were satisfied with refuge and waste collection while 63 are satisfied with doorstep curbside recycling the full quote was not put in um, in relation to the amendment so basically, I just wanted that amended to read for fullness and clarification. Thank you, Councillor. So that was in the report, not in the actual minutes. Okay. Thank you. Official announcements. Obviously, there's a motion on this matter later on the agenda, but I would like to propose that we have a minute's silence now in respect of lifelong Newcastle United supporters, Liam Sweeney and John Alder who tragically were victims of the Malaysian Air Airlines flight MH17 in July this year. Please stand and join me in a minute's silence as a mark of respect. Thank you. Item four, petitions. We have received no petitions for this meeting. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, there's a more announcements here. Following the by-election last Thursday, I would now like to welcome Councillor Joey Keating back to the City Councillor as Councillor for North Jesmond Ward. I will ask Councillor Catherine Walker to introduce him and then ask Councillor Keating to say a few words. Councillor Walker? Well we, well, we hope a few words, but if the past anything to go by. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It gives me great pleasure to introduce, um, or should that be reintroduce, Councillor Jerry Keating to Council. Jerry was a councillor for 26 years before standing down in 2012 and really needs no introduction. Jerry moved to Newcastle at the age of 10 and attended St Cuthbert's Grammar School and went on to Cambridge University. He was appointed to the Royal Grammar School where he taught politics and Latin for 33 years. Um, 
Jerry um, has always been keen not only on watching but participating in sport, particularly long, grueling events. And he used to run several marathons a week. I feel exhausted just mentioning it. <laughs> Jerry was involved with coaching and trained some um, outstanding athletes and cross country runners. Until recently, something he's proud of, he held the over 60s indoor rowing world record with his brother. Although some would say it's not real rowing, which should be done on a, a river or for the more adventurous across the Atlantic. And no, Jerry, I'm not suggesting you do that. <laughs> Jerry still participa participates in sport but also has his grandfather duties, looking after his granddaughter Vivian. And I'm not sure which he finds most exhausting. As we know, Jerry has always been independently minded. And in the 1975 elections, when many of the members here were mere toddlers or not even born, um, Jerry's was the only house in Princess <coughs> Avenue, Gossip, which did not have um, a John Shipley poster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> computers, they're really not Jerry's strong point. And uh, if he does manage to send an email, you usually get half of the message in the header box. And uh, <coughs> keyboards, not good with those either. And you usually get an email which at first glance looks as, as though it is one very long sentence. So Jerry's undertaking IT induction this week. So it advise everyone to keep well clear when that's happening. Um, Jerry's now married to, to Lucy, who was previously um, a North Jesmond councillor. And uh, so you could say he's keeping it in the family. Um, and I've been told by Lucy that she has a, an affectionate pet name for him, the wily old curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry will be an excellent counsellor, as he has already proved. Peter and I are looking forward to working with him, and he will be an asset not only to North Jesmond, its residents, and the council, and I think many people here are looking forward to hearing his uh, unique speeches. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Keating. Right. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and uh, uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Twenty-eight and forty years ago, when I first did this, I was introduced to council by uh, Hugh White, then the deputy leader of the council. And I knew what he was going to say because he'd asked me to write it for him. But I didn't know a word of what Catherine was going to say, although I did know she'd been consulting my wife and I, I was a little bit worried that various <laughs> Achilles heels would be uh, exposed. Just, uh, just like to say that um, I, I received this uh, agenda last Friday. It was sent to somebody called Alderman Keating, who no longer exists. Um, and it, it, looking through it, I thought, well, uh, has all that much changed? Uh, we still uh, have uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Beecham here with all his wit and erudition. I wouldn't say he bestrides the council like a colossus, but he certainly continues to have a, a very considerable interest. Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, looking back to the 1980s, I see we have a number of what I would call anti-Diluvian -Diluvi motions based on the 1983 manifesto. We still have a, 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 a degree which some people don't like, but I don't mind, where, where we have ad adversarial politics. It does lead at times to hyperbole, uh, but uh, it's okay by me. Uh, then there are the council howlers, which regularly appeared, and this month I found something called chairs forward. And I thought at first, 
well, is this something to do with the chair being a flirtatious lady uh, of the kind that Jane Austen would uh, deprecate? But I'm sure she will uh, 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 explain to herself. Uh, uh, Catherine's right, I am uh, an individualistic and uh, quirky uh, individual. I have at times been in an iron minority of one in this place. I was the only person to vote against the regional government. And if we have a debate, debate on the noble cause of Scottish independence, I would certainly be all uh, in favour. So, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I will uh, do my best on, on my return to the Council to represent uh, all my residents, all my, uh, sorry, all my electorate, all my citizens. And uh, I look, funnily enough, I've been re-energised. I am actually up for it. Thank you. And you have an eternal fan with my mother-in-law. You got a, a no balls sign a few years ago, Jerry. So there you go. Finally, can I remind members that about a couple of briefing sessions which have been organised. <laughs> Firstly, you will have received an invitation to briefing sessions on the Council's lettings policy and housing options. The sessions will be held on Wednesday the 16th of September and Friday the 25th of September from 5pm to 7pm in a committee room in the Civic Centre. I hope you will take time to attend and I am sure the briefings will be helpful in supporting residents in their search for a home. In addition, a further session for all members on Council Finances has been organised for Thursday the 11th of September from 5pm in the committee room. This has been organised for those members who were unable to attend the session earlier this afternoon. Okay. Item 5, we have a presentation from Newcastle City Council 2012-2014 under the title Our Legacy. I would like to invite members of the Newcastle City Council, sorry, Youth Council, to report on their two years of services as youth councillors in Newcastle. This is very good. I had a sneaky, sneaky preview earlier. Hello, I'm Jessica and I'm a youth councillor for Central Newcastle. It's nearly the end of our term in office and we welcome the opportunity to share with you some of our highlights and achievements. New South Newcastle City Council realised that young people were going to be particularly affected by their proposals to save £90 million in their budget. We were therefore approached by the council to consult with young people and ask them how the cuts might affect them. On Saturday the 19th of January 2013, we fresh-faced Newcastle Youth Councillors nervously journeyed towards the Discovery Museum for our first official consultation event with Young Geordies. After an almost overwhelming response, young people clearly expressed their worry about the cuts. The proposed loss of services led to concerns about where similar support could be found, and mo most asked whether the loss of support and things to do would lead to more young people choosing a bad path. When we reported back to Newcastle City Council, we asked them to restore hope for the young when making their final decisions. Although, unavoidably, <coughs> most of the cuts that would affect young people were still made, we were proud of our work as a youth council. One silver lining was made, however, thanks to our consultation. Cheviot View, a unit for children with severe disabilities, remained open and was therefore able to provide critical care for young people in need. <coughs> Hello, my name is Liam and I represent the West of the Newcastle. Newcastle Youth Council has developed a close working relationship with the Newcastle City Council over the past four years. One of our main aims of the Youth Council was to, um, was to get the young people's voices heard and to be taken seriously. We believe we have made great progress on this. The new Youth Council office in the Civic Centre has allowed young people to be closer to the um, decision makers in the city and we have attended and spoken at Policy Cabinet's Children's Trust Board in Cabinet in the full council meetings. We have also taken part in various consultations and made a difference. An example was on the new SEND transport arrangements when our opinions were taken seriously and influenced in the final decisions. We have worked with young people from across the world. After young people from Shinshiro, Japan, visited Newcastle in 2012, they were so impressed with us that they set up their own youth parliament when they returned home. 
we have made young people's voices heard in Newcastle and internationally. Hello, my name is Neil Cottery. I'm a representative of East Newcastle and member of the Youth Parliament for Newcastle. In late 2012, the UK Youth Parliament selected Curriculum for Life, a drive to improve the content and the delivery of PSHE in schools, as a national campaign following the nationwide consultation Make Your Mark. As discussions during the second Newcastle Youth Council's initial sessions demonstrated a desire to improve young people's life skills, a project named Ready for Life was devised to run in parallel with this national campaign. Ready for Life has proven to be one of the Youth Council's most widely recognised and productive campaigns. Following a City Council vote to endorse the project, Bridges School and Excelsior Academy have run consultations with pupils and trial lessons, the results of which form the recommendations of a recent report. The Youth Council's sterling work for this campaign has now gained national recognition and information collected has aided the Youth Parliament campaign. A tremendous achievement to be proud of. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dominic and I'm a Youth Councillor for the north of the city. As a first for Newcastle, young people set the agenda for September 2013's policy cabinet debate, seeing Newcastle through young people's eyes, where we discussed five main themes. A lot of people who shared their views were young people, not only from the Youth Council, but from other groups and organisations as well. The media coverage from the Evening Chronicle helped raise awareness and profile of the Youth Council, both inside and outside of the City Council. Policy Cabinet boosted our profile greatly and really put us on the map as a potential partner and resource for the Council and other organisations. As, well as, as well as raising awareness for the Youth Council, we promoted the profile of issues raised by young people across Newcastle. After our presentation, Nick Forbes, leader of the council, said you successfully engaged many other young people outside of the youth council in the conversation. The cabinet <coughs> members and I listened to everything you said, and we are now more committed than ever to acting on issues you've raised. Hi, my name is Mariam, representing Central Newcastle. The school nurse programme started in. 2013 by the British Youth Council and was funded by the um, Department of Health. The Youth Council took it on in 2013 and we found some really interesting things. When you went into schools, uh, um, year 9s and year 10s at um, Kenton and Woolbottle School um, between February and April 2014, we talked to 391 students and three additional focus groups. During the half term, we pulled together in this information and um, <coughs> made the key points that we found. Number one, young people needed to know who their school nurses are. Confidence and p confidentiality and privacy were really important to young people when it comes to school nurse. And thirdly, young people want a choice and, and to support who their school nurse is. The commissioners have taken this, re um, this report recommendation to a number of forum groups and um, we've already seen some progress. One youth councillor has already seen progress in their schools with um, assemblies and appearances of posters advertising the school nurse programme. Hello, my name is Katie Cowie and I represent the East of Newcastle. In March, the Youth Council decided to make child poverty a main priority for the rest of the year. In Newcastle, we started a campaign on transport which affects all types of young people, particularly those who live in poverty. In this campaign, we decided to raise just over £1,000 for 210 pop cards to be distributed to children in Walker Technology College. This campaign was thus very successful and achieved without stigma, a key point we wanted to avoid. Also, Newcastle Youth Council has been involved with regional and national work on child poverty. Two of us attended a residential in London where we were joined representatives from London, Liverpool, Manchester and the rest of the North East and met with the all-party parliamentary group on poverty to discuss a ma national manifesto that, if accepted by the next government, will hopefully be the first step to eradicate child poverty <coughs> in the UK. Recently, myself and another youth councillor met the group again to finalise the manifesto and begin our local, regional and national actions. Locally and regionally, we will be focusing on transport and education respectively.
My name is Beth and I represent the West of Newcastle and I'm also a member of the UK Youth Parliament. A sincere thank you to all the young people in Newcastle who took time out to share their views with us through surveys, focus groups and meetings. And we hope that you feel that you've been listened to. We are grateful to officers and leadership and members of Newcastle City Council for their ongoing support and assistance. We also extend our appreciation to the numerous organisations and projects that have assisted us on our campaigns and priorities. We also thank all members of the staff at Children North East who have assisted and supported us. We, we have worked on lots of different issues over the past four years and have tried to make a difference to the lives of children and young people in Newcastle. It is our hope that the foundation we have laid will serve as an anchor for all the young people who will take up the mantle in the future years to come. Finally, we would like to ask Newcastle City Council to support young people in Newcastle through voting yes to the following. In the future, the City Council will automatically consult with and feedback to young people through the Youth Council, but also with the wider youth population of the city on issues that will impact directly on them, for example, the current review of services for 0 to 25s. Can I invite Council to vote on uh, the proposal we've just heard? Ah, sorry, we've got Councillor Kingsland. Well, I think that's pretty unanimous. Um, um, can I invite um, Councillor Kingsland as a portfolio holder to um, say a few words? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I can't believe it's two years, actually. It's gone incredibly quickly, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you all. Um, I've been particularly welcoming the opportunities that we've had to discuss matters like the budget and Cheviot View and other really important issues for yourselves and young people across the city. Um, I also, I've been particularly impressed with the recent work that you've done around child poverty, highlighting issues about how transport can be a barrier for some, some young people. School uniform, um, another campaign that you've been running recently, which can be a barrier for some young people attending school. I just hope that the hard work that you've done, because you've covered such a wide range of subjects, will be pursued by the people who succeed you um, next <coughs> month. Um, and I'll just say I'm really looking forward to joining your celebration on Saturday. You deserve it. Thank you, Councillor Kingston. Uh, we have a number of people who wish to speak here. Can I call on Councillor Forbes? Thank you, Lord Mayor. And can I first of all start by saying a huge thank you to all of the young people who've been involved, not just those who've come along for the presentation this evening, but everybody who's been involved over the last couple of years, all of the people that have worked so hard to make the, um, uh, the Youth Council such a success. And I just wanted to offer my reflection on uh, the last couple of years because I've had the pleasure and privilege of working alongside many of the young people here today and others over the last couple of years, uh, engaging consistently in our policy cabinet debates. I thought the policy cabinet that we held in this chamber, where the young people themselves presented and posed real challenges uh, to us as a city council about how we were going to deal with the uh, issues ahead of us. Uh, I thought that was a magnificent example of young people showing a real interest in their surroundings, a real interest in their society, a real interest in our city. And uh, the, uh, I, I want to pay tribute to the uh, fantastic work that you've all done. Uh, you can all be extremely proud. We are extremely proud of you. And the very first slide that you put up said that you wanted to restore hope for young people in our city. Well, there are some who would seek to give young people a bad name. There are some, some who would seek to say that young people are not interested in political issues, not interested in getting engaged, not interested in getting involved. You've proven them all completely wrong. You've shown that young people in our city have a vision for a better society and that you're prepared to put in the work to make that happen. And I know that as the Youth Council moves forward into its next stage, one of the commitments that we gave 
was that we would find ways of working even more closely with you so that it wasn't the case that you would be consulted at the final stage of decision making, but we would find ways of making you more and more integral to the ways that the City Council does its business. That was the commitment that we gave as a cabinet in the policy cabinet that we had, and I'm delighted that the next phase of the Youth Council will see that start to happen even more consistently than it has over the last couple of years. <coughs> so, uh, Lord Mayor, I think with the uh, fantastic presentation that we've just had, I know we can all be absolutely uh, safe in saying that our city's hands are in uh, very good hands, the city's future is in very good hands for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. <coughs> Councillor Faulkner. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I apologise to the youth councillors on behalf of those uh, antediluvian members, as Jerry's were like myself, who are a bit slow in, trying to, in picking up what you were asking us to do there, but uh, we're very pleased to support this uh, concept of, uh, of, of entrenched uh, consultation and as the leader says, hopefully engagement, participation and real influence on, uh, on policy. Um, uh, I've had the pleasure of being involved with the Youth Council really from the launch with Jeff O'Brien right through to uh, your budget day, which was great. You gave us a hard time, which was right. Uh, a lot of your international working and I thank you for all of that and the quality of your report and your presentation tonight, which of course reflects the quality of all the work that's gone on over those um, three, four years really, not just the last two years. Um, and I particularly uh, congratulate those members, Beth and Matthew Otubu, who's not here, uh, Beth who is, for their work at a national UK Youth Parliament level because it, they've given a tremendous reputation to, to Newcastle uh, because of the, 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 their ability to, to articulate, present and, and really to pass on the good things that are happening in this city with young people. So well done on that. And it's not meant in any patronising way. I'm genuinely impressed. Um, I just want to say, raise, if I may, and young people may comment if they choose to, or others may, or we might just leave it on the record, but I have written to officers about two or three issues. One is that it does bother me a little bit, and I know it's the constitution that young people are represented through a structure that, that has them involved in school, at school age, 11 to 18, but many youth councillors around the world actually engage older young people, if you know what I mean, eight, beyond 18. Um, uh, and I do think it's something we might think about here, and I'd be interested at some point in the views of, of, of the youth councillors about how we might do that, and I believe there's some thinking going on already uh, about that. The other thing is, is that the, um, the council's responsibility in taking over from Children North East, and I agree that Children North East have done a great job, we should congratulate them, uh, so that what was set up as an independent youth council is, is now supported and rooted in the city council a bit more, um, I gather it's been deferred, the transfers have been deferred for six months. Um, I think the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. We want to see what quality of service that you get. We're interested in what you say about that. Uh, we want to be able to prove that we have the capability, the capacity, the commitment to service the Youth Council in the same way, if not better, than it's been served before. Um, and, and finally, I just want to say that, that there are some local authorities, and the one in Gateshead on the other side of the river is one of them, which have found a way of engaging all youth councils with other youth agencies and organisations in their borough. And I do think perhaps that's the next step for us, so that your influence can be all the greater by the way in which you might influence and work with the other youth organisations. So congratulations and thank you very much for tonight. Thank you, Councillor Faulkner. Councillor Cott. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I would like to congratulate members of the Youth Council. Um, I think your presentation was very good. You're obviously working really hard and have been working really hard to represent the interests of, of young people. Um, and there is clearly some evidence of you actually taking initiatives and then delivering upon them. So I think you've got a very good legacy to leave. Um, and like everyone else, we won't repeat all the other things, but I just really think you ought to be proud of yourselves for what you've achieved. Um, one or two things that occurred to me as well when I was hearing your presentations and other questions, I'm not sure whether you're, you're going to be responding to questions, but one thing you mentioned is uh, about the, the developments of the future, and I was wondering whether there's anything else that perhaps um, elected members could do to support you better, whether you've actually found working with members of council uh, a good thing, whether, whether hopefully you have, may, maybe there were some ways in which our working with you can improve. The other thing, the other thing I was wondering as well is um, if you were continuing 
whether there are any issues that you'd like to see further developed and what the priorities you might think uh, your successes might take up for the future. We'd be very interested to hear about that. Maybe we won't hear about it now. I don't know whether, whether they'll be responding, Lord Mayor, to anything, but I would be interested in some of those things. But well done anyway. Thank you, Councillor Cott. Councillor Nitalower. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I'd just like to add my congratulations to the members of the Youth Council. Um, I, I think I knew what I understood what we were voting for earlier, which was for the Youth Council to be involved in some in council policy for young people. And as the Chair of Scrutiny, I would like to say to them that we are actually doing something in September about Sure Start, and we would really welcome their views because we're having an evidence gathering session, and I'm sure we can arrange something where they could come along and contribute, and we would really welcome that. That's okay with them. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lower. Now, I don't know if um, your council wants to respond or if you'd like to take it away and uh, have a think about it and respond to the questions in writing. Yes? Well done. So I, I'm not sure there's any specific questions you'd like me to respond to, but I'll just try and go through um, what I can remember has been said. Um, on, on the matter of whether we'd like to sort of expand our age range, um, that, that's something that can be considered by the next Youth Council. We're ending our term of office at the moment. But yes, as you can appreciate, um, being young doesn't really stop us um, 18 years old. Indeed, the EU uh, seems to dictate that young people uh, leave off at age 35 or something like that, um, which is a subject for debate, I'm sure. But yet, yeah, that, that's something we can certainly look into, uh, and indeed at the lower end for primary school children as well. Though, um, with our sort of niche that we've cut at the moment, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, it's not really for me to decide. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to think what, what else has been said. Sorry, can, can any, of you, any of you give me some pointers as to what I should be responding to at this point? Sorry. Any pointers? Yes, okay, right, thank you. Um, well, I think all in all, it has been very positive. It's been a very positive experience for us, um, and it's sure I, it's one that uh, we'd like to continue. It did worry me, actually, when I learned that we were coming out of the jurisdiction of Children North East and into the City Council, whether this would be a negative, whether um, this would mean that we'd lose our independence, whether um, policies would simply be dumped onto us and we'd have to simply be the dog's body that would go around doing things. What we've learned um, in this transition process is how valuable being part of the City Council is, how many connections can be made, how being rooted in the City Council's way of doing things uh, gives us a real input into policy decisions. And I think that's something that's very valuable and something that could be really looked into and expanded um, with the future Youth Council. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Thank you everyone for your comments and um, your support, your continuous support throughout our term of office. You were asking, I thank you uh, Councillor Kingsland for your comments on child poverty which I've been focusing on as well. Um, throughout that bit of kind of, bit of the youth work, um, we are holding an evidence session on the 28th of November. Um, it, that will be focused regionally on education. I will be sending further information about that. But it is an opportunity to get involved and on a national level as well as a regional and local level. But just to, for, my, for the sake of all the young people in Newcastle just, and all the northeast, just kind of be as supportive and help them as well. And your support there would be of most help. So I will be sending information. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a very professional response. I think that deserves a round of applause as well. You've also been a huge success and a very uh, clever fate accompli getting that proposal in and getting a vote on it. Congratulations. Now you, may, you can stay for the rest of the meeting if you wish or if you want to go and have fun, <laughs> feel free. Thank you. Item 6, Students in Newcastle Forum Annual Report. Before I ask Councillor McCarty to introduce this report for information and discussion, 
I would like to seek Council's agreement to representatives from the students in Newcastle Forum to take part in the discussion under Standing Order 29B. Does the Council agree? I would call on Councillor McCarty to move the report and to invite the guests, secondly, to say a few words. Councillor McCarty. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm really pleased to um, bring forward this report to um, City Council tonight. Um, before I go into um, the presentation, Lord Mayor, can we just welcome Jamie and Tom from Northumbria Student Union, um, Francesca and Katie, who are two of the students from Newcastle College who are here this evening, and um, Jackie, who's a member of staff from there, and Lindsay, who you'll hear from shortly, um, who's representing Newcastle University Student Union. We're really pleased that all of those um, uh, members of the forum are able to be here tonight to join us in um, discussing the report uh, at Council. Um, so I would like to welcome um, the students and staff um, along. And, and Lord Mayor, as you know, we're agreeing that we would share the time in presenting this report, discussing this, uh, with representatives from the forum. Um, I, I think before I go into the um, content of the actual report, I'd like to express thanks to Carol Yeo, who has um, worked really hard over the last um, year or so to support the work of the Student Forum in Newcastle, um, and especially for the quality of the report, albeit the spelling mistake. Um, but the um, work that has been supported uh, fantastically by Carol, and she has chosen to leave the council uh, for a change of career. So, Lord Mayor, I think it would be good if we could wish her, uh, thank her for the work that she's done to support the forum and offer best wishes for the future. Uh, and, of course, the forum looks forward to working with Kirsty, who will be um, the new Carol in, um, in, in the work of the forum. Um, Lord Mayor, turning to the report, I think it is true to say that the student forum, the students in Newcastle Forum, is growing from strength to strength. People elsewhere in the country want to find out about what we're doing, um, want to learn how we have achieved um, such a strong partnership in working together. Uh, and we've been sharing some of that learning um, with our colleagues across the country. We've discussed, as you will see in the report, some really important issues. Um, health and well-being. We've had success around the um, registration of students and the focus on um, emotional health and well-being. We know the pressures that students are under in terms of not just their um, educational, uh, the, ed the education that they're um, receiving, but also in relation to financial hardship. Um, and those issues altogether mean that there is, um, you know, more response, more research needed, and, and increasing needs really in relation to. Um, the health and well-being of students in the city. Um, Lord Mayor, we've also had lots of discussions about housing, so we've obviously worked together. To, we know that there's still more to do, especially uh, in relation to the private rented sector and the quality of provision across the city, um, but also in relation to the importance of um, communities, really. In, you know, we're trying to build communities. We don't want students in um, parts of the city. We want communities to be mixed uh, across the city centre. Uh, and I think we've got quite a bit of work to do. You know, I'm, I'm delighted that we have um, received support for our policy on to let boards. And I think that will help to impact on safety of students across the city. So I'm really pleased. I know we'll, we'll have time to discuss that, uh, no doubt, at a later date. Um, in terms of crime and community safety, I think we've done a huge amount of work. We are, according to the report, the seventh safest city um, out of the 25 involved in that. And the projects and programmes that have been undertaken to keep students safe in the city are really important, especially in relation to drugs and sexual violence. Um, we're doing a significant amount of work to improve communications and promoting the positive contribution that students make to the city, as well as um, you know, in terms of things like volunteering, we can do a lot of work in promoting what students do as volunteers. But we've also, um, as you will see in the report, um, made sure that students are aware about the uh, bulky waste system so that they can actually make sure that their flats are emptied um, appropriately. And there are several other uh, really good examples um, of the work that we've undertaken in the city in the uh, report before council tonight. Um, we have discussed as well um, the importance of international students as ambassadors of the city, not just when they're here, but actually when they go back, uh, if they do. And, and remembering, Lord Mayor, that there are about 50,000 students across the city. And I believe the success and the vitality, the importance of the contribution that students make to the city, um, we need to recognise and take account of in the work that we do. So, and an accolade, I guess, um, 
if I can be so forward and bold. Um, many students come to study here, love the city and stay, and we'll hear from some of them tonight. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. Thank you. Can I invite our visitors to our guests? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Lockie and I'm a Director of Membership and Democratic Services at Newcastle University Students' Union. So I'm not a student officer, I'm a member of staff who supports and works with the officers. Okay. Okay. Um, first thing, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we do as an organisation and how we've worked with students in Newcastle Forums and then uh, colleagues from the other institutions will also speak as well. Uh, basically, Newcastle University Students Union, or NUSA as we now brand ourselves, represents, supports and enhances the experience of all Newcastle University students, whether that be here in the city or at some of our campuses abroad now, including Singapore. Um, to fulfil our vision of having a positive impact on the experience of every student, we set out some key strategic objectives this year to continue to focus on having um, to move towards being ranked sorry, in the top 10 students union in the UK for student satisfaction, to target particular efforts on international student experience, to ensure we campaigned effectively on behalf of our members and to improve our ability to en enhance our volunteers' employability skills. Um, we've had a very successful year and we're now ranked eighth nationally as a uh, student's union for student satisfaction in the National Student Service, uh, Survey, which is an 82% satisfaction rate up from 16th next, last year, so we're really proud of that. Uh, we focus really hard on supporting our international students for some of the reasons that Joyce mentioned before, and we got a 97% satisfaction rate from the International Student Barometer, which placed us fifth nationally. So as an organisation, we are really starting to excel and really support our students. Um, and uh, we've had other successes and other awards, such as we have uh, held the Guardian Student Publication of the Year Award for the two years running. So we're also putting Newcastle on the map uh, nationally in those kind of arenas as well. Uh, but on to how we work with the community. The Students of Newcastle Forum has been key to us to really uh, start some dialogue with people over at the city and within other organisations on issues that affect students and how students contribute and affect the city as well. Um, our, we have our own community strategy which uh, concentrates on a key number of areas and much of what we do is really summarised within the Students in Newcastle Forum. We have our Community Volunteering Bureau, for want of a better way to put it, called Student Community Action Newcastle, or SCAN for short. So some of you may have heard about that as opposed to NUSU, but that's actually part of the Students' Union. This year we had 44,680 volunteering hours given by students in the community through SCAN working with over 200 organisations. We also have um, Student Green Fund, is a kind of national initiative. We have £270,000 worth of external funding over two years to run seven strands of environmental initiatives. Uh, that ranges from guerrilla gardening, where we've been out clearing up Exhibition Park, to giving out green grants to schools to run their own initiatives. Um, we've also run a Mind the Gap campaign on mental health, which is summarising that report, which is something that's been really successful that we want to continue. Issues with students that we come across, housing is our number one issue, as I'm, support, I'm sure you're not surprised. We do have a student advice centre, which I have responsibility for, and housing is our number one case. 24% um, of students nationally have slugs, mice, or other infestations in their property. 61% have reported they have damp, mould, or condensation. So it is something that continues from my days as a student, I'm sure many of you, to, uh, that housing standards really need to be brought up for students. The, um, this year we've recovered nearly £11,500 in deposits for students that landlords were keeping wrongly. Without us intervening in that, that money would be in the pockets of the landlords and not of the students where it should be. Um, community safety, we um, were pleased to see the Nate Light Levy introduced and some of the community safety initiatives that have been placed, such as uh, the training for door staff within the city and also um, the safe haven. Although that is on Friday and Saturday evenings, and it would be really nice to see that actually supporting students more rather than concentrating on locals and when they're out in the city in the big market. Uh, going forward, our priorities for this year, where the community is concerned, we are in our second year of the Student Green Fund projects that I mentioned. Um, and also, we are widening our scope into going into schools as a student's union. We have got money uh, from the university to now start a new scheme where our clubs and societies will be out in schools uh, telling uh, local, local young people about the other side of university life. Like, it's really important for your experience, but we will be out there delivering workshops on like, how to write for a paper, since we've won those awards. We'll have our, maybe our rugby team out there doing some rugby coaching and then talking to young people about all what else you can get involved with at university. Thank you very much. 
Hi there. Um, I'm Jamie Thompson. I'm Vice President of Welfare and Equality at Northumbria Students Union. Um, I'd like to first, firstly thank all of the councillors that we've had the pleasure of working with in the past year, um, and also all of the members of the Students in Newcastle Forum. Um, we've had a really successful year. In the past year, we've had a, a lot of focus around uh, mental health and housing, which has been uh, briefly mentioned before, and you'll see a lot about that in the report as well. Um, Due to this focus, we managed to establish these working groups or subgroups in the forum, which meant that we could get the relevant people around the table to make some key change and make some key contacts as well, um, so that that change could happen. The work on housing in the community has been led by some of our students, so uh, rather than the, student of the sabbatical officers, it has actually been um, current students who have been leading on that, uh, which was very refreshing to see. Um, to see them kind of set up the full campaign themselves and to encourage and support them through that. Um, I'm pleased to actually say that one of the students who was leading on that has now got a full-time job as a community organiser and I, I think that's genuinely through his, his work in the community and working with yourselves. Um, I think in terms of the, the coming year we look forward to working together um, once again, working together with the councillors and so forth, but also with other institutions. It's a really important year. It's the election year, which I'm sure uh, everyone's sick of talking about. Um, but we, as a, an institution, really want to work with other, other students' unions around the, the North East to set up some um, kind of strength in student numbers and make sure that students are aware that they have the right to vote, that they need to vote, and that uh, they end up with an election that definitely works for them. Um, I think as well, we've done a lot of work in the community with our volunteering, and one which I will mention is our IT classes project, which has won um, national recognition this year too many times that I can actually keep track of. Uh, it's been a really successful project, and we hope that we can base further projects and expand our volunteering um, based on that model and hopefully see um, similar success. Um, I think something that Joyce mentioned before is the fact that community is so much more than just a, a location or a, a place. It, it really is a sense of belonging and that's something which um, students really strive for. Uh, whether they do live in the area for a year or for three or for the rest of their lives, uh, it's about making sure that it is a, a positive community and that they can contribute towards that and, and really feel part of the area that they live because after all it's it's not just a house that they're living in it is a home and um, so we do work really hard towards that and uh, I do look forward to a lot more partnership work over the the coming year and further work with the, the local police as well which has been uh, really successful in the past year too um, I think that's all from me but once again I'd like to thank everyone for the support and for the opportunity to speak tonight as well so thank you very much thank you Hello, I'm Katie Bradshaw and I'm the Learner Voice and Students Union Coordinator at Newcastle College. Newcastle College has approximately 20,000 students studying full-time, part-time, higher education and further education. Our provision is very diverse and ranges from 14 to 16 year olds, 16 to 18 year olds and 19 plus from all over the North East, further afield and including international provision as well. Last year over two-thirds of our students were over the age of 18 so they do also make up the voting population of Newcastle. One of the common issues faced by our students is financial support and hardship. Many of our students apply for financial support from the college and this may be their only gateway into further education. The cost of travel is also a big issue which I know was brought up by the Youth Council earlier. Um, for instance, some of the learners who are aged 16 to 18 and based in Northumberland will no longer <coughs> receive funding for travel and will this will therefore limit the courses they can choose and the career options they can have for their future. We have also worked on a number of projects to improve well-being. The Students' Union has been working alongside the Forum, the Police and other unions within the city to challenge and raise awareness of the dangers of legal highs. We have also been working with the NHS and youth teams across the city to help students be aware of their sexual health, contraception and young parent options. In all, however, we have had a great year at the college. Our international student support team came runner-up in the internationalisation awards. Our 14 to 16 provision in its first year has received good feedback from Ofsted as part of a monitoring visit. And the, the, univer the college is currently working towards taught degree awarding powers. That being said, student feedback continues to be imperative towards everything we do at the college. And students are actively involved in the discussions that we have at course, school and senior management level, as well as forming the driving force behind everything we bring to the forum, which of course is the things that you get to consider today. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Four members have indicated that they uh, wish to speak. I call on Councillor Kane. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. As the, the opposition member on the forum, I'd like to thank both universities, the college, the students' union, and everybody else who takes part for their, their commitment and their uh, positive approach to, to some of the issues we've been tackling. Uh, the report lays out all the progress which the forum has made and flags up uh, the benefits which having those two vibrant universities, a great college, and all their students bring to the city. I would, however, like to make two points, uh, neither of which will be any surprise to Councillor McCarthy, I'm sure. Um, the first one is the focus of the forum. It's broadened massively over the years um, since it was uh, first started by, by Councillor Faulkner behind me. Um, but I feel it shifted a little bit too far from its original focus, which was on some of the challenges arising from having a large uh, and constantly changing student population. I'd like to see that back at the core of the forum's agenda. You know, this year I was particularly disappointed, as everybody will know, uh, that the issue of dumping by student landlords over the summer wasn't tackled properly by the forum, uh, and we had that problem once again. The cities who have done this properly, who have tackled it proactively, have done so through partnership with the universities, with the student unions, with the landlords, and it is the ideal forum for that particular issue, um, and I would like to see it right back at the centre of the agenda because that's what the long-term residents of the ward are, are desperately concerned about. The second point I'd like, which is uh, apologies to our visitors, this is a, a little bit of an internal one, but the, the council formally nominates four councillors uh, to, the, to the forum, including the chair, but uh, we have in the last year had five councillors, uh, all of whom have been allowed to participate as a full member. So I wrote to Councillor McCarthy some time ago asking whether this meant that uh, representatives of North Jesmond could join the forum, uh, saying as they have a very large student population and, um, they, and they could come along and uh, discuss the issues as affects North Jesmond. And I've received no reply to date, so I'd uh, be very grateful if Councillor McCarthy could reply now. Thank you very much, Lord. Thank you. Councillor Higgins. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I first of all um, thank our student representatives for coming along this evening. Uh, I'm a tremendous supporter of student presence in the city. I think you bring huge benefits to the city um, and I really welcome the presence of students in the city and the students here this evening. Um, I'm a councillor for um, Benwell and Scotswood Ward um, in the city and Benwell and Scotswood Ward is one of the more disadvantaged parts of Newcastle. And one of the things that has concerned me over uh, recent years is the low numbers of young people from that community who go on to further education. And these are young people who kind of lack appropriate role models in their life so that they can aspire to the kind of courses and the kind of studies that you do yourselves. I've long felt that students could have a positive impact on the lives of those young people around Bemmel and Scotswood, but I sense there's a kind of divide between the student population and these young people from these more disadvantaged communities. And I wondered whether the student forum might be a place where you could discuss some ways that you could perhaps engage with people from areas like Benwell and Scotswood and act as mentors or role models in terms of inspiring them to go on to further education in the future. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Stone. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to welcome the forum's work and their report, and a lot of what's in there is positive. I'd like to raise one thing that's not mentioned in the report, as best as I could see. Um, I'd like to ask about the issue of late night disorder and noise. Um, does the forum consider that still an ongoing issue and are any steps being taken by the forum to look at that? Thank you. Councillor Ashby. And thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I re-declare my interest, which I uh, am on record uh, as the, the chairman of a company <coughs> providing newly built student accommodation in the centre of Newcastle. Uh, other fine accommodation providers uh, are available out there as well. The, uh, the universities have made a significant impact on the infrastructure of this city uh, with, their, with their new build programmes. Uh, and it's the overall economic effect that, that I'd like uh, to, to come back to. Um, of the £850 million pounds that, that's spent uh, by the, uh, the <coughs> two universities and the college, uh, I would ask Councillor McCarthy if we can know how much of that £850 million comes from the UK government, um, how much from UK students through the fees that they pay, uh, and how much is coming from overseas students. 
Um, and I'd also be very interested to know, uh, from the business community's point of view, um, how much do all of these students, these 50,000 students, uh, spend in, in our city on goods and services? Uh, I, I know some 22% of our 50,000 uh, student population uh, are overseas students. Uh, that's a really impressive uh, figure. Uh, I also note that there's a record year for recruitment uh, in the, into the universities as well, so that, that clearly economic circumstances uh, are not stopping uh, people from, from flocking here. Um, but in a, particularly in respect of the overseas students, um, I, I'd be interested to hear more about how we engage with them uh, so that they get from the, the most from their time with us to go away to be ambassadors for this region. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd really like to welcome this report and congratulate everyone involved in the, uh, in the forum. I think it's absolutely brilliant to see such a great, such a strategic partnership working towards further engaging with students in, in our vibrant city and hearing how it goes from, it's going from strength to strength. With the numbers of students, you know, we've heard 50, over 50,000 students and um, over 11,000 students from overseas living in Newcastle. They contribute greatly to the economic, social and cult cultural fabric of our city. And representing a ward that has a high student population, I've seen firsthand how much they give back in terms of their volunteering, not only gaining valuable experience for themselves, but giving back to their community. That, that's become their home for, for you know, the next few years and perhaps indefinitely. Um, Jesmond Local, which is res mentioned in the report, is a great example of this. And how we see, but we also see students leading in um, you know, volunteer groups such as on, on environmental and other schemes. I work in the voluntary sector and I witness on a daily basis students giving their time to help out in schools, sports clubs and other organisations, passing on their skills to others. The two universities and, and Newcastle College bring millions of pounds of investment to the area, as well as providing much needed employment to thousands of local, uh, local people. We should welcome students to our city with open arms, and we need to make sure that they feel that they can get involved in their community, but also to feel very much part of the communities in which they live. The Student communi Communication Group, which includes the council and other agencies, are giving students information about how they can look after their, their local neighbourhood. Information as simple as, as when to put your bin out can make a huge difference because many of these young people are, are living away from home for the first time and they need advice and support to make sure that, that they really feel at home while they're here. And all of this will contribute to making and ensuring that their time in Newcastle is safe, happy and memorable. I really welcome this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Councillor Walker. Um, the, uh, the report uh, mentions student housing from the viewpoint of um, ensuring that uh, students are not uh, pressured into um, signing contracts for properties after they've only been in the city for a couple of months and that they're safe and uh, that they're not exploited, all of which um, are very important. However, it does not reference students and permanent residents and advice which should be given, although other parties do provide this. And I just wonder um, what part a student forum um, could play uh, in association with the student reps, could play in this both in the short term and long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Councillor McCarty to reply. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, can we say thanks to Lindsay, Janie and Katie for their excellent contributions? Um, I, I think the debate tonight is, uh, has been um, excellent, Lord Mayor. I mean, including the members of the Youth Council earlier. I think it shows us the value of um, the young people who are in the city making a difference uh, for us all. Um, if I can turn to the questions tonight, um, just to be absolutely accurate for Councillor Kane, the background to the Students in Newcastle Forum um, came from a motion which came to City Council um, <coughs> some years ago, actually, I can't remember when, several years ago from uh, ex-councillor Henry Murison. Uh, so I think claiming credit for work is, is a bit much when actually it started um, from the uh, Labour Party contributions. 
Um, the focus of the forum broadening massively. Uh, well, the, the difference between the party on this side of the council chamber and the party on that side of the council chamber is we value what students bring to this city. And um, on that side of the council chamber, they see the students as they see students as bringing challenges in the local area. And I quote directly from Councillor Kane. That is exactly what he said. Um, we've moved away from dealing with challenges. So actually, we're dealing with, in this forum, uh, and led by people on this side of the council chamber, we're dealing with the benefits that are um, brought um, by the numbers of students that are in the city and address the um, important issues that affect us all, Lord Mayor. Uh, many of those uh, colleagues and others have mentioned tonight. Um, but I raised the whole issue about housing. I raised the whole issue about safety and security. All of those things are important to us all um, and equally important to the students who live in our city for some time. Um, Councillor Kane also asked about representatives on the forum. Um, the forum does have a representative. It isn't really um, a voting body. It's more uh, um, for taking issues forward. Most of the work of the forum goes on in subcommittees. Uh, and personally, I have no objection to other councillors being involved in that. Um, you know, if representatives from North Jesmond would like to contact me and tell me how they would like to be involved, I'm sure we can arrange for that. Um, Councillor Higgins raises important issues about the low numbers of students in higher education, Lord Mayor, um, from poorer areas of the city. We know that that is an issue and I know that collectively we need to do that. And actually that question might have been addressed to the Youth Council earlier because you know, I think Councillor Kingsland referred to the work that they've been doing about social deprivation and poverty. And I think it could link very well with what the uh, Youth Council have been looking at. Um, in terms of Councillor Stone raised the issue of late night disorder and noise, um, a continuing issue and a real concern for um, local residents. Of course, those issues are addressed, shared and responded to. I think the community safety work has been really important and the police links that the um, universities um, fund at the moment, um, as well as us and others have done in the past, uh, is, is a really important part of the work. Um, Councillor Ash, uh, Ashby asks me um, some questions, Lord Mayor, which I am uh, completely at a loss. I, mean, I have no idea how much... I, we've not actually looked at the um, financial records of, of the both universities and the college, so I have no idea um, what the uh, income and investment of all of that is. I'm sure it's available on the public record, and I will endeavour to find that out. Um, in terms of what Councillor McCarty, we have a red line. Sorry, Lord Mayor, I'll just finish what I'm saying, if I may. Um, in terms of what students bring to the city, in terms of the economic worth, we all see that in our communities. Those of us who have students living in our areas, we see the impact when the students are not here in local businesses. And I think it's that kind of thing, Lord Mayor, which is really, really important. Um, and can we, Lord Mayor, before, and I know I'm going over my time, but can we congratulate Councillor Ainsley on her maiden speech? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Does Councillor Greater receive the report? We carry on. Item 7, Overview and Scrutiny Committee Annual Report. I would call on Councillor Anita Lower to move the report. Seconded by Councillor Franks. Councillor Lower. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present the Annual Scrutiny Report to Council and welcome the fact that it is the opposition that are the Chair of Scrutiny at the moment. The new scrutiny process that was put in place is now pretty much embedded and we've covered a variety of topics, but I would like to remind all backbenchers, if I can, all members, that they can join task and finish groups or suggest topics for scrutiny and I'd really like to encourage them to do so. Scrutiny belongs to all councillors, not just to the committee. Um, I'd also like to put on, thank, on record my thanks to councillors Kemp, Denham and John Stokel Walker for their contributions to the new scrutiny process it was very well appreciated and also their contribution to the task and finish groups which they are also still carrying on with. I have to say that one of the things we have had we've had a number of call-ins by members and I do feel that some of them could have been avoided if we'd actually had clearer initial reports and maybe that's something that, we, that we've decided that the communications task and finish group are going to have a look at. I'd also like to remind everyone that scrutiny is not just there to criticise or complain. The role of scrutiny is one of a critical friend we would welcome the opportunity to get involved earlier in the policy processes, including the budget monitoring, 
And we do have now a monitoring group chaired by Councillor Faulkner, which any member of council, apart from the Cabinet, can attend. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you to the Cabinet members and officers who've attended scrutiny and the contribution that they've made. Without everyone's contribution, scrutiny wouldn't be doing as well. We've had some really good um, task and finish groups, lots of wide-ranging topics, and I hope it continues this year. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lord Mayor. Councillor Franks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to um, second this. Um, and I'm Labour Vice Chair of Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, and like the rest of the Council, the scrutiny function has had resources uh, reduced. But looking back over the year, looking at this report, it's clear that the new system has been very affected, effective and resulted in a range of good, focused pieces of work that I, for one, am very pleased about the work we've done this year. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Labour members, in particular, uh, on both scrutiny committees for their hard work, both in the main committees and in the task and finish groups and the other work undertaken. People have put in a lot of time. Uh, members take their responsibilities for independently scrutinising policy and practice of the Council and other partners very seriously, regardless of party loyalties. Um, I'd, I'd like to mention also that we've had a number of new members join the committees this year and they're proving very effective. Um, thank you very much to everybody involved and I know that we'll continue to strive to be effective in fulfilling the, our, our duties as a critical friend. Thank you, Councillor Franks. Councillor Faulkner. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd just like to make three quick points. The first is I would describe the last year as being the year in which the overview and scrutiny function in the Council by and large recovered from the ludicrous structure that was imposed upon it by the administration a couple of years before. The whole concept of having separate scrutiny committees for policy and for service delivery was just was a, a nonsense, complete nonsense. So I'm glad we put that behind us and I agree with uh, uh, Councillor Franks that I think it's been a good year in making progress and getting uh, to terms with the issues. Um, the second point's briefly been alluded to anyway by uh, Councillor Lowe, but I will say it again, and we have said it at other meetings, and that is the poor quality of reports, not just the ones that get called in from Cabinet, but the ones that are called in after delegated decisions by members. And I think, to, to be fair, uh, members of the majority party have agreed and sometimes been the victim of those poor reports that they have to uh, propose and justify themselves. So I hope that the next year will be a, a year in which the, the quality of those reports will improve. And my third point is in my capacity as chairing the, uh, the, the, the Finance Working Party, uh, just to correct my revered leader, um, cabinet <coughs> members can attend as well. It's just that they can't be members of the group, but they can attend the meetings and be very welcome. And Councillor Dunn, I think, is going to come to the next meeting, which is great. Um, but I was sorry that the Cabinet seemed to take umbrage at the report that we produced on the last draft budget. Um, uh, and I think C Cabinet should uh, remember that compared to the previous times when there were half a dozen scrutiny committees looking in detail at the work of directorates and the proposals of directorates, now we just have one standing group and the main committee that looks at that. Uh, and therefore, we're not going to maybe get into quite the degree of detail that we might have liked to. Um, however, uh, we did point out, and I think it was fair that we did, the lack of consistency in the presentation of information. We were criticised for making that comment uh, because of, there was a lot of information, but it was the quality, not the quantity, that we were talking about. Uh, and the second thing that you seem to have taken umbrage with was, uh, uh, was the uh, suggestion somehow that uh, 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 instead of – that we were just looking at – our view that we were just looking at cuts. We weren't actually looking at a budget. We weren't looking at what the council was proposing to spend. We were looking at what the council was proposing to cut. Uh, and you criticised both of those points, but lo and behold, by the time we got the final budget report, we began to have some of that put right. And I'm pleased to say that it does look as though this year's budget process will involve us early, will give us the information we need to do a good job that contributes to you, the Cabinet. We're not in opposition. We want to try and contribute useful ideas and try and make that budget process uh, more effective 
may be less painful, but certainly concentrating on the priorities that the Council should be concentrating on. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, but uh, there are some issues I think we still have to address, but we have had a good year. Thank you, Councillor Faulkner. Councillor Peachum. Paying tribute to the two full-time members of staff we have on Scutineer, June Hunter and Karen Christen, who do a, a tremendous job. I know they're supported by uh, officers from other departments, but I do think one of the things that <coughs> ought to be reviewed, perhaps, is the level of, uh, of support that we can actually provide to this process. It is a very difficult time, of course, but on the other hand, mm. if we're going to do the job properly, then uh, we, we can't overwork uh, the, uh, the people who are doing it uh, for us so well so far. And also the, uh, the debate uh, so far tonight, um, whilst rightly paying tribute to the work that has been achieved in the last year, to some degree illustrates to my mind what has been perhaps a, something of a, an omission of the process in this council for some years, namely that we concentrate apart from the health scrutiny committee almost entirely upon the internal workings of the council. But we have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to look at uh, our relations with other agencies and bodies who obviously play an important part in the life of the city and whose decisions impact significantly upon what this council has to do. And there are organisations ranging uh, from schools, uh, which are of course semi-detached these days, uh, and in some cases almost completely detached uh, from the local authority, uh, to uh, the higher education institutions, the Newcastle College in, in the realm of further education, uh, but also we have coming up, uh, indeed already beginning to have an impact, organisations in other areas. For example, the probation service, or what's left of it under the current uh, reorganisation, that will, I, I suspect, uh, present significant problems uh, to us. Uh, we uh, could be looking, for example, at how government agencies are dealing with the issues of uh, youth employment and uh, of the benefit system which impacts so severely upon so many uh, of our citizens. Um, uh, these matters, uh, you could take for example, uh, asking uh, what action the government is doing to enforce the minimum wage uh, in Newcastle. It's a, it's a national issue, but what are they doing locally about it? So there are a range of things like that, which I would like to see as part of the, the mix uh, of, the commission, of the committee's uh, work, uh, balancing what we're directly responsible for with those areas where we should be used, using the mechanism to hold other people to account. And finally, I do think we need to look at giving more publicity to what the over-reintegrationary process in the Council is doing. I think our press department needs to be uh, more engaged with it. We need to try and encourage, although it's not easy, the local media to be involved with it. And we ought to use our own publications to highlight the work that we're doing and to invite comment uh, from the residents of the city on a whole range of things, not just those for which we are directly responsible. I think there's a proven track record and we can, however, uh, enhance it uh, by looking outside uh, the realm of, uh, of the, the Council itself and engaging with these other organisations. Thank you, Councillor Peachum. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the scrutiny officers for all their hard work, which certainly makes my life a lot easier. Um, I really just want to emphasise the important role of Health Scrutiny Committee uh, and in particular the challenge and uh, um, scrutiny that we provide to uh, other organisations as Councillor Beecham discussed and we do have this responsibility for looking at all proposed changes in NHS services um, and discussing whether they're appropriate and what they mean for, for local residents. It's been particularly important this year with the uh, very unwelcome changes to services at uh, Scotswood and Granger GP practices this caused a lot of concern to elected members and local residents and we were able to um, certainly make our views very well known um, and Jeremy very kindly set up a, a group to look at how this could happen. We also had uh, the proposed changes to the eating service disorders that caused a lot of distress to both users and relatives of those with this horrible illness. Um, we've had a number of very successful uh, uh, scrutiny groups, work and finish, sorry, task and finish groups and a very successful um, day where we talked about slips, trips and falls um, and I think we've made some useful suggestions to Cabinet on those issues. We have the autism review which is coming to our next meeting which again is a very important issue and I think um, members will be uh, reassured to know that one of our items of focus over the next year is the health and well-being of looked after children which I think in view of uh, what's been happening in other parts of the country
country is particularly important. Um, so I do think the Health Scrutiny Committee has an extremely important role. I think members have been excellent in engaging uh, with the committee. We have uh, a new system of having lead members who actually engage with the, the hospital trusts and the ambulance service to try and get a better um, focus. We've worked very well with the uh, Health Watch and uh, Wellbeing and for Life Board and we would hope to take that work forward over the next year. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Councillor Mendelson. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just speak this way. Mm -hmm. Well, this is good, isn't it? Um, yes. As Vice Chair of Health Scrutiny for the last 12 months, I want to endorse some of the views expressed, particularly about the excellence of the officer's support in helping to prepare and deliver our often very challenging work plans. I mean, in health, uh, as, as Councillor Taylor said, we've looked at many vital services and providers and very, very serious responsibility indeed. And a committee is only as good as its members, and our members have been exceptional, I think, this year in, in challenging a committee, um, in identifying things that we need to look at, in taking part in the task groups that uh, Councillor Taylor mentions and by acting as lead members with the trusts. One point I think I, I've been really impressed with in this committee, and I have to commend <laughs> Councillor Taylor in this, is the active encouragement of members of the public and community groups to get involved in the work that we do by inviting them to committee and if they raise a concern with one of us or one of the members about an issue then that will be discussed so i think i think that's a really vital way forward and actually having it's also sitting on overview and scrutiny i think it's probably something that that scrutiny role could do as well because it's certainly enhanced by the member uh, by by that uh, members of the public getting involved in the work of the committee, which I think is what it's really intended to be. So thanks to everyone, and uh, I look forward to a, a quite another challenging year. Thank you, uh, Councillor Melderson, and for your initiative as well. That was uh, well done. I call on Councillor Anita Lower to reply. Um, can I just say thank you to everyone, Lord Mayor? Um, yes, I think we do have a problem with resources, and we're trying to use them to the best of our ability. Uh, I would like to say thank you to Jeremy. Some of the things that you mentioned we have already looked at, but we have not had a um, great debate with outside bodies, and that's one of the problems we have. We've had some evidence gathering days, which went really well, where we brought everybody in to, 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 to talk and to look at things. I think there's a lot more that scrutiny could do, but that has to be tempered with what is brought forward as being important to us. We have a lot of standing issues we also have to consider, and the resources that we deal with. But I do feel that scrutiny has become more effective and, and I'm sure if anybody did want to suggest anything or actually do anything themselves, we would be very willing to hear from them and to, to deal with them. And I hope that pe more people will take the time to get involved and take part in scrutiny. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you, Councillor. Does Councillor Goody receive the report? <laughs> Item 8, reports referred from Cabinet. Safe Newcastle Plan. Cutting crime. Protecting communities in Newcastle 2014-17. That's one of the cuts we all want to see for a change. I call on Councillor McCarty to move the report and Councillor Powers to second. Sorry, thank you very much, um, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, I'd just like to make a statement, really, um, to be very clear about the situation in other parts of the country that's drawn, and, I, and I'm sorry about this, but I am going to read it to make sure I'm not misinterpreted. Um, Lord Mayor, as I present the Safe Newcastle Plan for members' approval, it's all too clear that issues of crime, sexual abuse and exploitation of children and adults in cities across England have been and continue to be heinous crimes committed against the most vulnerable members of our communities. We must listen to victims, no matter how uncomfortable, um, the information they provide is and provide them our protection and support. I'm sure all members are aware and horrified by the media coverage and the report on child sexual exploitation in Rotherham and um, will join me in condemning the perpetrators of such shocking crimes. Each local authority needs to robustly challenge its practice in line with the recommendations of the independent reports into child sexual exploitation. And you have my commitment and those of my colleagues that we will do so in Newcastle too. Um, we stand together to condemn all of those who commit such horrific crimes and we stand together to support those who are harmed and damaged by them. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, in bringing this um, safe Newcastle plan to City Council, Lord Mayor, I'm really pleased that we have the opportunity to do that. It's important that City Council has the opportunity to see the three-year plan, um, the uh, um, work that has gone on over the previous year, and um, see the proposed uh, investment for the future. Uh, and before we go into some of the details in the report, Lord Mayor, I think it would be right for us to thank all of the officers who've contributed to this work. Newcastle, although um, I'll come to the crime figures in a moment, Newcastle remains a safe city, and I think that's down to the hard work, the um, strength of the partnership working across the city, uh, and indeed the effective policing that we managed to keep our uh, neighbourhood police officers on the street and our chief constable as we hear annually when she comes to talk to us um, is striving to maintain that. Lord Mayor, the um, report that is before us tonight includes some new um, powers that are available to uh, councils in terms of the antisocial behaviour tools and powers uh, on page 67 of the report. Um, so it includes those new powers and the actions that the council may need to take and indeed it talks about um, the uh, taking into account those um, issues it talks about the new ways of working and the training needs that officers may need across the city in order to be able to deliver those um, lord may i've mentioned that we do have some challenges now no doubt members across the council chamber will want us to refer to uh, the outcomes in performance on page 90. Um, many of us are, will be shocked about the increase in shoplifting um, and it is, I don't know, it's just a dreadful situation when people are actually stealing food to feed their families. And I, I really believe that the um, problems we have in the economy and the um, way the coalition has dealt with um, the needs of the most disadvantaged people across the country is leading to such increases in crime. Um, I think the uh, increase in violent crime is a huge worry. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm sure that Councillor Powers can um, say something about that. Uh, and of course the increase in um, secondary fires that are reported there. Um, those things are a worry and, and we do need to have debates about um, what we can do about them because we have a, a shared responsibility to uh, resolve them. Um, the report, Lord Mayor, refers to um, how we have invested a lot of time and effort into uh, ensuring the nighttime economy um, and still maintains the safe city uh, that I've talked about and I think we talk very clearly in here about what the work that we have done uh, in relation to that um, but I think the thing I'm most proud of really is the work that we've done on reducing domestic violence um, and it isn't about necessarily reducing domestic violence because actually uh, if if people reported domestic violence the figures would go uh, shooting sky high but I think what we have done in Newcastle in responding to that and making sure that the right support is available for victims uh, and actually the amount of officer time that has gone into our um, proposed solution for this, the, um, the um, proposed development that we're likely to build across the city over the next couple of years, I think will make, make sure that the victims of domestic violence are really well supported uh, in a holistic way. So um, <coughs> I'm really pleased to bring the report tonight, although it isn't good news right across the city, we need to acknowledge that uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. Councillor Powers? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll be the motion, Councillor Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and, and thank you for, for the report, too. The, the thing that concerned me most uh, within this report was the figures on the increase in violent crime um, with, within the city. Um, Fear of violent crime is, is, is a major concern to, to our older citizens um, and reading the report, it, 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 it left me with an impression that we, we were in some way not grasping this, this particularly bad issue. And I think that crimes against a person are, are far more important than crimes against property and I would, I would be much more concerned about violence than I am about uh, making points about shoplifting. Thank you. Councillor Higgins. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, in making the points that I'm going to make and, and asking the question, I first of all need to declare an interest as an employee of the National Probation Service. And in fact, Councillor Beecham has already alluded to the comments I would make about page 80, which talks about the government's transformation, transforming rehabilitation programme 
that's brought about significant changes, notably the creation of a new national probation service and regional community rehabilitation companies. Basically, Lord Mayor, this is the creeping privatisation of the probation service and the increasing fragmentation of the work that's done with offenders. The impact of this has been increased workloads, disproportionate workloads, and a demoralising effect on the workforce that I think undermines their capacity to work effectively as part of the Safe Newcastle Partnership. Um, the Deputy Leader of the Council and also Councillor Hobson have been very vigorous in the past in supporting NAPO's campaign to oppose these measures and I would ask them to continue, or ask the Deputy Leader in her role to continue that support in the future. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Anita Lower. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I'd like to ask a question um, and make a comment on the increase in violent crime. I think that one of the things that we, we know that this isn't related to the night crime economy, but it actually relates more to domestic violence and violence in the home. And I know that we have the nighttime levy for the city centre, which contributes to the safety there. But I just wondered what resources are being deployed to actually combat the rise in domestic violence, given that we're looking at more repeat domestic violence cases coming through the Marrick. I just think it's important that this is an issue that we, we need to look at where the funding is coming from. And tied into the same issue is about the funding from the Police and Crime Commissioner and how much of that money can be, if there's any funds from the Police and Crime Commissioner to look at dealing with this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Councillor Lower. Councillor Talbot. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just say thank you for this report. I think it's very, it's, it's transparent, it's accountable, it's worrying about the increase in crime, but to, just to, in violent crime, but to talk about what Councillor Lower said, it is actually more to do with violence within the home as opposed to the nighttime economy. <coughs> One of the things that I would like to say is that although older people may have a fear of violent crime, they are the least likely section of people to suffer from it. It's actually younger people who are more likely to suffer from violent crime. So I think we have to kind of balance evidence against perception and come out with a way of dealing with both. The other thing I'd like to do is to thank the community safety officers within the council and the housing officers and police officers who regularly attend the SNAPS meeting and to thank them for their responsiveness. And again, at the local level, I think there's such a, a wealth of partnership working where we were able to work in the, in the local area to actually identify and nip some crimes in the bud and work with local people to do so. So I think this is a very helpful report. Thank you, Councillor Talbot. Councillor Sledis. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it, it, this is a good report, as it's been stated by others. There is progress being made. Uh, certainly, support um, uh, measures being taken to tackle domestic uh, violence and, and sexual <coughs> violence. Uh, I must say, uh, from the SNAPS meeting that we had last night, uh, uh, related to my award, uh, there were quer queries raised, including by myself, about uh, the, the, the increase in violent crime. Uh, the local police officers. Uh, stated that actually the, the violent crime actually includes things that most people wouldn't consider in any way violent crime, things like antisocial behaviour <coughs> causing a, a commotion on the street, which, uh, you know, I, I think we need to... Uh, there, w there was a general feeling in our SNAPS meeting that there needs to be better clarity on the statistics so that we're making uh, correct decisions on a lot of things uh, to, make, to make sure that uh, things are comparable and that we're talking about the same things when we're talking about violent crime or indeed any of the other categories. Uh, the sergeants undertook to take that away, but I mean, it's not, it should really be something that look, be, is looked at at a more strategic level to make sure that we are making the progress that we all want to see uh, uh, in this uh, by looking at um, properly consistent statistics. So I thought I would uh, contribute that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salidis. Uh, no other member has indicated he wished to speak, so we're back to, oh, sorry, Councillor Beecham. You'll be, you'll be the last one, Mr. Six. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of issues in what is a very comprehensive report, I think, and a very welcome report, that perhaps uh, need to be added. Uh, a year or so ago, I attended a meeting, as did other members of the Council, at the uh, uh, City Library, uh, about veterans' courts in America. Uh, and I took forward a proposal which was supported quite widely, uh, at any rate, in the House of Lords by including, amongst others, eminent former uh, admirals and generals and the like. The government, alas, did not accept uh, the notion of dealing specifically with the uh, problems of uh, veterans who found themselves after service 
committing uh, offences. Uh, they set up a working party under Rory Stewart instead, which was to look more broadly at the issue. Unfortunately, in some respects, he has gone on to become chairman of the Defence, Self uh, Defence Select Committee, and the thing is somewhat in abeyance. Now, I do think locally it would be helpful just to look at uh, the position of ex-service people uh, in the criminal justice system at a local level. I think that might be an additional uh, ingredient to the plan. A couple of other things that might be worth doing are looking at the impact of what is happening in our prisons on the likely reoffending rate. We've had very disturbing reports of uh, what's going on in Accrington Prison. Uh, a whole series of prisons in this country are suffering from <coughs> massive overcrowding. Today, the Wormwood Scrubs has been identified as, as uh, in a shocking condition. That is bound to impinge on how people uh, behave when they eventually are released. The chances of Securing rehabilitation, if they've had a very bad prison experience, are uh, pretty minimal, and I do think uh, it might be something worth looking at, uh, regionally perhaps, uh, rather than specifically uh, within Newcastle, uh, but also clearly in conjunction with the uh, relevant uh, police commissioners, because uh, the reoffending rates remain stubbornly high uh, at, at across all levels, and although the government's got aspirations about dealing with that, many of us, <coughs> as Council Higgins has, has uh, have very grave concerns about the particular methods they're adopting, and we should certainly need to look very carefully at how the National Probation Service, as it is now uh, termed, operates in our patch. It's on the agenda, but uh, it ought to be given considerable priority. Thank you, Councillor Beecham. Um, Councillor Powers, we say to you to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to, to second this as the Deputy Cabinet Member for Community Safety and Regulation. If I can start by first reiterating the thanks to our partners that uh, collectively make up the Safe Newcastle Partnership. It's without the, the, the fantastic input and support and work that they do and joining up an approach that we're able to do the, uh, the very many positive things that we do in the city around making sure that this city remains a safe place to live, work and enjoy. Um, and also like to, to, to pass on my thanks as well to, to Councillor Hobson who uh, previously had this role before I stepped into the, uh, her shoes. There were awfully big shoes to try and fill. She's done a lot of fantastic work um, in tackling um, uh, community safety issues and particularly around domestic violence. Um, and it, it, it's, 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 it's a, a huge uh, person to try and live up to in this role, but I, I am, will be trying my best uh, to try and do that. Um, if I could just pick up quickly on, on, on the issue around what a couple of members' concerns around the, the increase in crime. I would, I would say you know, we've, we have a long-term trend of crime being down in the city comparative to 2008, 2009. Um, crime is 26% down in the city uh, now than it was then. There is a slight increase around 1% this year, but this is in the backdrop of a, an increase in 5% force-wide. So we must still be getting something right in Newcastle and we're still, we're still uh, uh, really um, performing well. Um, particularly around, uh, one of the issues that have been raised around um, domestic uh, sorry about uh, violent crime. Um, I think there's there's a number of factors what really link into this. I think um, Councillor Sleeves perhaps is, is right that we have this, this um, statistic uh, includes assault, sexual offences, and robbery. And perhaps we need to break that down um, or, or state it more clearly on the report to give people confidence in what statistic they're looking at. Um, but I, I certainly will be able to look at that. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the number of increases that we are seeing in these crimes coming forward, I think is partly due to the excellent work we've done around tackling domestic violence and giving people the confidence to come forward when uh, they've been a victim, to be able to uh, make their voice heard and, and find justice in that. Um, and also the, the, the heightened media publicity that we're seeing around us. Um, so, but we are doing still a lot of work on this and we will be establishing the uh, Violence Against Women and Young Girls group that will look at a whole raft of domestic violence issues, including sexual offences, um, genital mutilation, uh, forced marriage and, and, and other forms of domestic violence. Um, so we are still, we are still prioritising that, it's still the main focus of our work and we, we hope to come back next year and, and, and report even more positive works that we're doing on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powers. Call on Councillor McCarthy to reply. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you to um, colleagues who contributed to that discussion. Um, we recognised, Lord Mayor, that violent crime would be um, uh, the issue of focus for many colleagues across the room 
uh, this evening. So I hope we've given enough information, but if, if anyone is interested in more. I, I mean, it's really sad that um, victims of um, domestic violence experience something like 13 incidents of um, that kind of violence before they make a report. And actually, if you raise awareness and make it easier for <coughs> victims to uh, make that report, well, then obviously your figures go up. But actually, we're doing the right thing in, in encouraging people to report that. And I think we have to see this in the round, Lord Mayor. The um, Wellbeing, Care and Learning Directorate, for instance, have a Troubled Families team. Uh, we're not calling it that, the Newcastle Families team. And actually trying to address that um, in a holistic way, I think, is part of the um, solution to the um, problem. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, Lord Mayor, for the benefit of everyone in the room, Newcastle is and continues to be a safe city. Um, like other cities, we have the occasional problems, but in the main, this is a safe city, and it has been uh, improving, really, year on year. So this is a bit of a blip, and we, need to, we do need to react um, positively, and we need to work together in order to resolve it. Um, but in relation to Councillor, Councillor Ashby's comments about shoplifting, Actually, I kind of take exception to what he's saying, because on this side of the council chamber, we care about the most vulnerable people in this city, um, and we want to do as much as we can to support them. Councillor Higgins raises a really important uh, issue of privatisation, and um, as we've made that commitment in the past, we will continue to do so. Um, you know, I, th I think that that issue needs to be raised with the coalition government. We do oppose that. We're really worried about the outcomes of that. And I think Councillor Beecham um, raised some of those issues in his contribution um, that, that are kind of part of that outcome of privatising services. Um, Councillor Lower um, asks about the funding in relation to the uh, MARIG. Actually, I'm not sure about what we get from the PCC, so I will come back to you in relation to that. But I, I, I think I probably addressed the question about domestic violence. Um, I think Councillor Talbot raised a really important issue about partnership working. We continue to do that. Um, and I think Councillor Salidas answered the question really in relation to what's included, because I think it includes robbery as well as uh, you know, what we would think of as violent crime. Um, and yes, I think we should pick up um, Councillor Beecham's point about the <coughs> regional work through the um, Police and Crime Panel, Lord Mayor. So I think we will come back to uh, Jeremy about that and see what we can do in relation to that across across the Northumbria Police area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. <coughs> Is the report agreed? Thank you. I've been asked to make an announcement. Uh... Oh, you want to laugh at Right, OK. OK, we'll carry on. Okay, item nine, questions by members. We received two questions more for our reply on the standard order 9A. Each question is deemed to have been put. I would like to invite Councillor Stevenson to reply to the first question from Councillor Stone. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> I do apologise, my voice is, I think it's this uh, council chamber, my voice seems to croak and croak when I come in, but never mind. I'll continue. Um, in relation to the question as, as noted on the sheet uh, from Councillor Stone, I will relate specifically um, to the issues around EnviroCall and to the actual evidence given that I have in relation to calls. Specifically relating to these, in the last six months, the average time a caller has had to wait is 196 seconds. During the wait, customers are advised of their queue position, alternative contact routes, such as email or website, and general information that may prove helpful to them around a variety of issues. Our target response times vary across ind individual categories of environmental issues, such as fly tipping, graffiti, grass cutting litter, and dog fouling. These targets on these issues are available for anyone to see on our website. In the first quarter of 2014-15, we have received 3,623 requests in these specific categories outlined and completed 91% of them within the target response times. With regards to public satisfaction, a customer survey was carried out as it is carried out every year um, and it was carried out and updated in December 13. 
and the findings have shown that overall satisfaction when calling the contact centre stands at 72%. Furthermore, 71% of callers surveyed said they were satisfied about the length of time they were waiting for their call to be answered. As ever, we are always looking to improve services. In spite of this, your government's unfair and disproportional cuts to metropolitan areas such as Newcastle. We have always strived to prove exceptionally high services for our customers and residents and built them up over many years. Due to these limited resources imposed on us, the impact is what we see now. The most common query across all our customer services is housing benefit and entitlements to benefits imposed by your government. Even now, even now, the facts are there, the evidence is in, the reports given, and ultimately the figures to the calls. These are still, even now, the most uh, more calls being made. Staff are coming up with ideas to support us and how we do things differently. They are working under extreme pressure. I, myself, and Councillor White have gone down and have listened into calls, actually listened to the calls from residents and the complexity and the time that's taken and needing to support residents in any way they can is immense. And they are operating under pressure and are literally doing a very good um, professional job. Lord Mayor, this question is an important question because the misnomer is that everyone is unhappy with EnviroCall. And I can see the light is on, but I think it's important yeah. the facts are given. Um, and ultimately, um, having been down there and having not only witnessed the calls, taken calls, heard calls and frontline customer services on a regu fairly regular basis, I do recognise the issues. We all as members should and do, because I know from all the emails I get and see through officers, appreciate the concerns that residents in all our wards have. That is one of the reasons why an offer has been made um, for all councillors, emails have gone Mr. out, Mr. asking for, Lord Mayor, if you just indulge me one moment, yeah. asking yeah. for officers, to, uh, for members to come forward with their concerns around EnviroCall. Myself and Councillor White have met with the Chair of Scrutiny and the Deputy Chair of Scrutiny to look at issues relating to EnviroCall. If money was there, it would be put in services. <coughs> It's the government cuts that have meant we've had to pull back on things. And it's a fact. It's no good arguing and mourning. It's a fact. But what are other people doing about it? We all, surely, on these issues, have to work together to provide services for the community that affect us all. And that's what we are trying to do. The email on the meetings and for concerns has not yet, from the 1st of September, had a single Liberal Councilor Democrat Stevenson. councillor put their name forward, yeah, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Could, I ask, could, I, could, could, I, could I ask the officers to confirm that the time limit for this item refers to the item on the agenda and not individual contributions from the Cabinet member? Lord Mayor, sorry, could, could you repeat the question? My understanding, Lord Mayor, just for the benefit, is that the time limit on this item on the agenda is 15 minutes. There is no specific requirement in the Constitution to limit the, the length of the reply that can be given by the Cabinet member in any particular circumstances during that 15 minutes. Yes, just so. I don't need advice. Uh, Lord Mayor, there, there is a general provision about the length of speeches being three minutes in the standing orders. It's important. I, I, I think, Lord Mayor, um, I think it has generally been approached on the basis that um, responses would comply with that time limit of three minutes. I think that has been the general practice. Okay. Okay. Um, Councillor Stone, supplemental. To many of the residents who contact me, that the EnviroCall reporting system, response times, and clear up rates are underperforming, and by extension, so therefore is Councillor Stevenson. Despite having the highest spend on social media of any council in the country, this councillor is unable to log EnviroCall requests on Twitter. Does the Cabinet member therefore agree with me that the system is no longer, no longer user friendly and is not fit for purpose? 
Lord Mayor, I think that's more a description of my colleague who's just spoken. However, what I will say, Lord Mayor, is I think that is appalling, and it's appalling to the staff that are operating these services. If we had the funding and hadn't had funding cut, and I will say it again, and I'll say it about a million times tonight if I have to, <coughs> if my voice less, um, if that was the case, we would be in a service that we used to have. We have always in Newcastle um, targeted where money needs to be spent to the most needy. And our environment covers across every section of the community, wealthy and not so wealthy. Um, everyone has bins to take in, everyone has concerns, and everyone has the right to be able to voice them in any forum they can, including ringing us. The survey has highlighted the information. Tonight alone, I've been spoken to in this council chamber by a resident in the east end of this city who said they've contacted Envirocall and cannot commend it enough for the response that's been delivered within 48 hours of their contact. Now, you know, we hear all the brickbats and all the things that don't work. Very rarely do we hear things that do work. And a lot of councillors are out there working with residents to help us in a voluntary capacity to make sure their neighbourhoods are clean, to make sure they are doing things that need to be done. And they value the one number because it's less cumbersome than having numbers putting through to everywhere. Some councils don't even have an envirocall service. We are doing our best to support residents and keep that despite the budgets. Supplemental, Councillor White. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd be interested in the Cabinet view, uh, members' views on the role of staff and their contribution. Uh, thank you, Councillor White. Um, well, I have already alluded to the staff. Um, and the officers and the senior officers working in Envirocall and overall in the whole of the neighbourhood services and delivery teams and operations. I think, to be quite fair, um, if I can be, I think all of us would agree they are working on the front line with residents in a very difficult manner. Um, I would just commend the staff and what they're doing in very difficult times. I would thank them for the work they're doing in coming forward with alternatives, because they are coming forward with alternatives, ideas of how we can do things differently and how we can support residents more. Because let us not forget, at the front line, the other ones getting the brickbats of all the decisions that are made in here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Um, final question, supplemental from <laughs> Councillor Sutcliffe. You mentioned the unfair financial assessment from the current <coughs> If we'd had a fair settlement, how much more funding would we have now to spend on Envirocall and keeping our back lanes and streets tidy? Right. Um, thank you, Councillor Sutcliffe. Well, overall, if the government had have given this council uh, the funding initially in the length of this parliament, um, I believe the figure we would as a council have had would have been an additional £38 million pounds to spend on residents and services within this city. Now, quite clearly, there's an awful lot we could do with that. There's an awful lot of job retention we could have with that. And there is an awful lot of not only streets and parks um, and services and delivery of services across the whole of the city that could have been maintained had that money been kept in place in the rightful place where it should have been instead of, in my opinion, stolen away by this horrendous draconian government who has no leanings in relation to the north of this city, uh, to the, the northern regions of this of this country and what the decimating effects these reductions in uh, funding are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I will now invite Councillor Stevenson to reply to the second question from Councillor Kane. Right, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, while we have no significant increase in the report of four-legged vermin in 
the Osborne Ward over the summer months. I am aware, as Councillor Kane has alluded to on occasions in this chamber, of the problems of some of the back lanes in Osborne, which are caused by antisocial behaviour of a small number of irresponsible people within the community. With the resources available, I know local services have been proactively deployed within back lanes and back lane crews working across Usburn, North and South Eaton wards. And I do know in Usburn um, those staff have been commended by members for the work they have done. A significant amount of work has been done to address a number of the problems in Usburn, many of them proactive and preventative measures employed. And Councillor Kane is aware of a number of these because he has been involved in some of them, such as enforcement patrols over the summer months, carried out by environmental crime teams and a comprehensive programme of engagement with students where a group has been set up to look at issues. Landlords, we did bring something to council and I did inform council that the uh, landlord permit scheme would be reintroduced. This was done so and I also realise now that only four landlords have signed up to the scheme and only 27 permits have been used so far. So that's as much as the landlords are interested in supporting us and what we're doing as far as I can see. Communities team in the community have worked very hard with Living Streets and Councillor Kane's been involved with that himself. Um, so to indicate that um, a not, maybe a lot has been happening or nothing indeed has been happening is not true. Um, certainly in relation to an audit that was set out, a report and findings of them that have given overwhelming um, support to a trial of communal, communal buildings being rolled out across the ward and that has come from that team and other suggestions were street bin audits and initiatives to do with litter picking and um, student involvement in volunteering. This is something that is happening in that ward, I, I don't need to tell but council needs to know that these things are happening. However, in the clearly, we would all like to see that back lanes do not have any issues in them alluded to. And it's again due to the cuts that this has happened. We can't get away from the fact. If we don't have the money, we can't deploy the staff and we can't put the work in. Now, what I would ask is people to take responsibility for their own actions. In my own ward, I've mentioned this before, resident groups are supporting us by doing it as peer pressure on residents. And if Councillor Kane, instead of asking me what I would do, uh, wouldn't pontificate in front of bins and rubbish that's waiting to be taken away, as the resident was quite clear to point out, rather than <coughs> be waiting for bins to be collected. And instead of that, pick up the rubbish from the overflowing bins. Maybe residents might join in, because I've done that on many occasions, and a lot of people on seeing us do it follow suit. Instead of being the blame culture, all of us, it's incumbent on all of us in our wards to actually get involved with these issues. And as I've said, this is a long-term issue and some wards are worse than others. So why can't we, instead of playing the blame culture and party politics on this, get in there and work together to help with residents in what they're living in? Because it's not everywhere, it's just in certain parts of the city. Thank, Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kane, do you have a supplemental? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think uh, Councillor Stevenson's complacency is outrageous. In the last three years, the people of Oosburn have suffered a botched change towards alternative weekly collection, a consultation communal bins, which consisted of a legal letter going out, and uh, another summer, this is not the first, another summer with rotting waste piled high in the back lanes. Will she apologise to the people of Oosburn for this litany of blunders? As far as apologies go, I think your government needs to apologise to Newcastle City Council. First of all, first of all, first of all for reducing the funding and secondly, secondly for not giving the funding when requested for weekly bin collections. Now, this is a factor and a factor that should be alerted. Certainly one of the things in relation to back lanes, there are a number of back lanes and back lanes which have problems in them. They all need to be looked at differently. If Councillor Kane could make his mind up, as others could, on communal bins which was brought forward from the group that he was sitting on to decide what one of the things we were putting forward in relation to trying to ameliorate the situation. These things haven't just happened in the last two years. These things have been going on always. And unfortunately, I don't want to pick out students as being the only ones that do it, because I know for a fact they're not. 
But ultimately, no one on this side is complacent around things like that. Unfortunately, your government is taking the money away from us in order to us to contribute to do it. And put your name down on the list to discuss things, and maybe we might move forward. But after all, you've got to stick with what you say and not chop and change outside the council chamber and in. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ashby. <laughs> Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, in the last two, uh, two questions, has blamed the government, government funding uh, for, for council inaction. Uh, what, uh, what is she doing to lobby the Labour Party for more money for local government in the unlikely event that Labour form the next government? And what response has she had from the two Eds? This side of the chamber constantly lobbies for a fairer settlement. Fairness is what we are standing on and have always stood on. Fairness for everyone. Everyone in this city has a bin after all. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, we have lobbied on that from day one, and we haven't stopped doing that, and we continue to do that. And ultimately, if some of our colleagues across the chamber did the same, maybe we might get some sense. I note that recently Pickles um, the Minister for Communities has decided to give Sainsbury's vouchers to some of, the, uh, some of the areas in the country where if they recycle more, um, if they recycle more, they can get Sainsbury's, if that you can believe what you read in the press. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, what all we wanted was what was rightfully ours in the first place, and we would have had a lot more work being done in the environmental services than we can actually currently prioritise. Thank you. Final supplemental is Councillor Beecham. Uh, Councillor Stevenson for dealing so effectively with the Kane mutiny. Uh, <laughs> uh, but could I also ask her to uh, agree with me that the Labour Party's pledge to redress the unequal distribution of resources <coughs> and direct resources to those areas like the North East, but not just the North East, which have done so badly compared to essentially Tory uh, represented areas in the South, uh, and acknowledge that that will make a significant difference in itself to the level of service that this city needs and which, you are, which we are all anxious to provide. Thank you. Thank you. We have received eight questions marked for written reply. These together with the responses have been circulated and have also been displayed in the, in the foyer. <laughs> Item 10 appointments. Are the appointments agreed as set out? <laughs> Item 11, notice of motion, Newcastle United Football Club. I will call on Councillor Denham to move the motion, seconded by Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. There are, from time to time, these events that happen in the world. They shock us, they appall us. In some cases, they may even make us fearful. <coughs> Yet we never expect to be connected to the pictures we see on the news. The loss of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 in July was one of these events. And yet, as the news emerged, many of us in this city and the broader area began to hear that, in fact, we were personally connected to it. John Alder and Liam Sweeney were two of the most passionate supporters of Newcastle United. The former had missed one game of any description since 1973. He was kind-hearted, thoughtful, and though I never knew, him too, never knew him too well, I will always remember the time he took pity on a naive, let's just say, 18-year-old who'd forgotten his wallet at one game in Germany and he took me under his wing together with some others and made sure the effects the morning after of consuming large quantities of hops, yeast, barley and water were suitably conveyed in a highly practical manner. Liam, I have to say I knew rather better. He used to regularly steward the supporters' buses that I use. He was a contemporary of mine and had basically seen the same ups and downs as I had over the past years. Though his desire and willingness to get to, or at least try and get to, every game far outstripped my own. I remember one cold evening when we'd just been turned over 6-0 in Manchester. There were some roadworks on the M62 and what should have been a short three-hour hop over ended up taking us seven and a half. I was sat with Liam on the way back and before the coach had started its engine, he was asking if I was planning to go to Portsmouth in a few weeks' time. Now, colleagues may not realise, but having lost 6-0, it takes a rather special supporter to focus on the mammoth coach trip to Portsmouth, armed only with some sandwiches and a single functioning toilet. <laughs> but it was not just knowing John and Liam that made this a deeply personal event. As demonstrated by the magnificent fundraising efforts spearheaded online by some Sunderland supporters, 
The community that supports football felt this deeply. Why? Because we all felt it could so easily have been us. We all would have liked to have been in New Zealand if logistics had allowed. John and Liam were two football supporters, off to follow the side they loved, and through no fault of their own, they never came back. Not only did we lose two individuals many of us knew, but John and Liam are a symbol. They represent something that unless you yourself share, I accept it is difficult to understand. Now I have a love-hate relationship with the football club. I do love it with a passion, and that love leads to a certain upset when things are not done correctly. And in many ways, it's hard to define what correctly actually is. Ask on a Saturday afternoon, especially after we've lost, at about 4.55, you'll get about 50,000 different answers to that question. However, the announcements made by Newcastle United Football Club to commemorate both John and Liam through their unveiled garden, the events around the first game of the season, which were very touching, and through the new Alder Sweeney Community Award, are not just to be welcomed, I believe they are to be praised and encouraged and given a place at the civic heart of this city. Too often, the portrayal of football supporters in this city is done negatively. Worse, it is often done in a stereotypical or patronising manner. What I can say is that for some of us, not only does it matter and we enjoy it, but it is often the basis of our friendships, our social lives, and is a solid base to which many of us have turned to when needing a distraction from the realities of day-to-day -day life. John and Liam, like us all, did not choose to follow Newcastle United. It's always something that chooses you. The world can be a very dark place on occasions. However, the actions of Newcastle United Football Club, the football community in general, have shown that despite, actually probably not because of that darkness actually, people can come together and really show what matters in life. And yes, Lord Mayor, that does include us humble football supporters. The late Sir Bobby Robson, whose own foundation has benefited so well from fundraising efforts in this region, once very famously said the following, which I will end on. What is a football club in any case? It's not the buildings or the directors or the people who are paid to represent it. It's not the television contracts, the get-out clauses, the marketing departments or executive boxes. It's the noise, the passion, the feeling of belonging, the pride in your city. It's a small boy clambering up stadium steps for the very first time, gripping his father's hand, gawping at that hallowed stretch of turf beneath him, and without being able to do a thing about it, falling in love. Lord Mayor, I reiterate that I congratulate those at Newcastle United Football Club, and I move this motion for John, Liam, their family, their friends, and all of us who knew them. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to declare an interest as a, a long-term season ticket holder at St James's Park, although these days it's more a habit than a joy, I think. Uh, but uh, at least these days we can't say the manager hasn't made us as good as Manchester United. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I mean, sport in a lot of ways does seem inconsequential, but uh, there are times when it does bring us together. The Olympics was a good example of that. Uh, but we also know sport can divide us. We know that from the, the rivalry between Newcastle and Sunderland fans. I think the antagonism these days is worse than it used to be. Uh, back when I was younger, the away fans used to have half the Gallagher end, and I used to stand in the flagpole end. Uh, in those days, I think there were more people who, uh, than now who actually supported both teams and went to both Roker Park and St James's Park. <coughs> but whether it was then or now, I have to say I really, really hate the Derby games. Uh, I really do. I mean, I honestly believe that the two captains should just meet in the centre circle, shake hands, agree a nil-nil draw, Likewise. and then we can all go to the pub together. <laughs> you know. uh, in recent years, the rivalry between the two clubs has sadly spoiled out in the violence on our streets, as we know, uh, as all this part of the pointless pursuit to prove that one city is better than another one 14 miles away. And then we have an incident like the MH17 disaster, and it just brings everything else into perspective. After, in the aftermath of uh, MA17, there were a lot of tributes paid by fans across the country and across the world to John and Liam. However, the tributes by the fans from our greatest rivals were the most moving. Here was a group of Sunderland fans who saw in John and Liam not only rival fans, but what they're seeing themselves, fanatical fans travelling the world to support their team. They set up a fund to send flowers to the funeral, 
And as we know, that mushroomed into thousands and thousands of pounds. I'm sure many in this room, like me, donated to that. Uh, now, there have been tributes to those Sunderland fans for that. I was on my feet welcoming Jimmy Montgomery onto the pitch of the first home game of this season. But I do wonder if we could do one more thing. You know, at this season's Derby game at St James's, I'd like to see the Sunderland fans who started this fund to be celebrated by both clubs before the game. Bring them on the pitch and give them an award of some kind. Perhaps, Lord Mayor, you and your counterpart from Sunderland could officiate in some way. It'd be an opportunity for both sets of supporters mm. to stand together and celebrate a great bunch of lads who put their rivalries aside to honour two fanatical fans of their local rival. And no doubt then we'll return to shouting at each other once the game starts. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent suggestion, actually. Yeah. 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 Councillor Leggett. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, if I could just add a, a very brief comment to the ones already been made, and I heartily, heartily endorse all that have been suggested. Um, I'm sure no one in the chamber tonight will actually even contemplate opposing this motion, uh, and I'm also sure that um, we all feel desperately sad about what has happened to Flight MH17. However, I know the families of, of John Alder and Liam Sweeney and all football fans have been deeply moved by the reactions of all concerned, and I hope we've added to that this evening. Um, now, there have been several debates and motions concerning Newcastle United in this chamber, and they all had one thing in common. Um, we were strictly critical of the club and many of the things that they have done. I don't recall one occasion we were, when we were anything else but critical of Newcastle United in the past. However, on this occasion, I think we have to accept that the club has acted in a very sensitive and dignified manner, uh, and all concerned um, have been particularly helpful to everybody. Uh, and I think that all credit must go to them. I certainly agree with Councillor Gallagher that all credit must also go to our usual arrivals at Sunderland Football Club. Um, they were quick to sympathise. And I think one of the great things that have happened is that their, their own supporters have clamped down very vigorously on the minority of fans who did produce offensive tweets and emails and so forth. And so again, all credit to everybody at Sunderland Football Club. Now, I think it has been suggested um, by Councillor Gallagher that this, there is this coming together on the uh, Derby Day. Could I just make one further suggestion? Um, I think it would be a very fine gesture if also all Newcastle fans decided that we would choose one match in the season when we would actually support Sunderland. Um, I propose to do this when Sunderland play Manchester United at Old Trafford, although, as <laughs> Councillor Gallagher has said, this isn't perhaps the, the daunting prospect that it might have been to our rivals down the road. However, Lord Mayor, I think we all agree that um, the loss of John and Liam is a, is a real tragedy and nothing should be allowed to detract from this. Um, however, if there can be some sort of positive outcome in reaction to this tragedy, then let's respect their memory and just make it happen. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Higgins. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've tried on many occasions in the past to explain my passion for football to those who do not share that passion, but with little success. It is a passion that unites we followers of the game throughout our lives at both times of celebration and despair. We're all part of the footballing family. Liam Sweeney and John Alder were very much part of that footballing family. The tragic events of flight MH17 in July therefore evoked a tremendous collective feeling of sadness and loss amongst all of us who are devotees of the game and an overwhelming sense of sympathy towards their families. I never had the pleasure of meeting Liam, but I did bump into John on many occasions at both Newcastle games and also local non-league football grounds, as such was his passion for the game. He was a very distinctive figure in his black suit and white shirt, which earned him the affectionate and perhaps rather poignant nickname of The Undertaker. John was even dressed in that fashion at a pre-season tournament that I attended in the Algarve when the rest of us were sweltering in shorts and t-shirts in 30, 30 degrees of heat. My hope is that some good can, can come from these tragic events and the magnanimous gesture of our local rivals down the road at Sunderland in raising funds in the memory of Liam and John is to be applauded, as was the laying of the wreath by their former player Jimmy Montgomery at the first home game of the season. The nature of our rivalry with Sunderland has developed into an unhealthy one in recent years, as shown by incidents of violence and the somewhat toxic atmosphere on match day. And I would like to see the events surrounding Liam and John's tragic loss as a pathway to improving that relationship in the months to come. I would also applaud the setting up of a memorial garden to John and Liam by Newcastle United Football Club, 
and endorse the view expressed in the motion about the importance of this club in the life of our city. It is a vital part of our sporting culture and so important to the morale of the community. It has therefore saddened me that, it, that the relationship between the club and the council has not been a positive one in recent years due to a number of factors and needs to be improved. I would support the view expressed that this is now an ideal opportunity to rebuild bridges and work more closely with the club than has been the case in recent past. Football is a force for good in so many ways and we need to recognise this fact. I support the motion, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Denham, did you wish to reply? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, very quickly, um, I, I admire Councillor Leggett's uh, optimistic view of life and getting us all to support Sunderland <laughs> for a day. Whether, whether I could go that far myself. Um, he, he can come back and ask me at the end of the season which, which game I supported them in. And uh, I agree with Councillor Gallagher's suggestion, actually, and would suggest that that be left with the Lord Mayor's office to perhaps explore further. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is the motion agreed? agreed. Item 12, fracking. I've been asked to make an announcement in relation uh, to item 12 on the agenda. Councillor Bartlett's notice of motion relating to fracking. Unfortunately, the wrong version of the amendment to the motion has been distributed to members. We have to correct the version and this will now be distributed. I would suggest that we have a brief pause to allow members to read the amendment before we proceed with item 12. I understand this is agreed with the Chief Whip of Labour, Councillor Cook, and with Councillor Bartlett. Sorry, Councillor Forbes, I didn't catch that. Can, can, I, can I ask why the opposition submitted two amendments? I submitted a, a, a submitted an amendment last week, but following discussions with colleagues and with discussions with uh, Linda Cook, I did say that there might be an alternate version, which was submitted in time, um, and uh, unfortunately the wrong version was printed in the, in the papers. So just to be clear, the opposition did submit two amendments? No, we submitted mm -hmm. an amendment and then changed it, which is perfectly reasonable. There's no reason why we should not the well, I, have, I think what we have here is an agreement by uh, Councillor Cook and um, <laughs> Councillor Bartlett. So. Take some time to digest the actual amendment. <laughs> okay, are, are we ready to proceed? I'm just I'm conscious of the times, Court of State. Fracking, I will call on Councillor Bartlett to move the, the motion seconded by Councillor Sutcliffe. <coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Fracking, or hydraulic fracturing, is really seen by many as the answer to all our energy needs. It's going to be a saviour of a time of economic and geopolitical threat. And yet, if you say the word accidentally, it virtually sounds like a swear word as a starting point. But the response from the Tory and Lib Dem coalition is just the simple erosion of further local decision making. The Growth and Infrastructure Bill looks to change laws on trespass and take powers away from local authorities. So as opposition grows, the government wants to steamroller over people's rights. The reality is that this is a government that is educated in Eton, supported by the Lib Dems, who want to return to a time of little regulation, covert oppression of the working people, and return to some glory years of industrial revolution of poor wages, no health and safety. Fracking is simply just one example of this. The Tory and Lib Dems are fixated on short-term gain. 
privatisation of the post office, changing the rules on drawing pensions to give a quick hit of 450 million into the coffers, and their dash for gas is a simple dash for gas <laughs> is an expense of society. Now the government has made an argument about jobs. Cameron quotes a creation of 74,000, and yet the government's own report from AMAC gave a forecast as low as 5,300 jobs nationwide. It's also said that fracking will give us cheaper energy prices, and yet Ed Davey has admitted that North Sea Gas never achieved that, so why would shale gas be any different? Supporters of fracking give the a case that methane is less harmful to the atmosphere than other fossil fuels. They call methane a bridging fuel that will help us move towards a greener power generation while allowing us to maintain our lifestyle. So is it greener? Well, the report to the European Commission says not. It said basically that the emissions for every unit of electricity brought in was 4 to 8% higher than the electricity generated from conventional gas in Europe. Now, the government's short-termism is understandable. May 15 is coming. So the fucking lobby wants to get things embedded as quickly as possible, get their profit streams going. And yet, as one writer has put it, we're being put through an uncontrolled health experiment on an enormous scale. Lib Dem Amendment might support our desire for local decision making, but they seem to think that regulation will work. But there's no specific onshore exploration or extraction regulations for natural gas, and the offshore regulations developed in the 90s are simply not sufficient. <coughs> the government's quite happy now to press ahead and, and get companies to engage in this process. So they're not going to beef up the regulations. The fracking lobby will not accept it. So it will be interesting to hear Councillor Taylor and Councillor Kane's arguments on that point. Our future needs to be one of renewable energy and better use of the energy we use. I'm not suggesting that we return to pre-industrial society. But as one writer put it, they argued that the earth can handle quite a lot of human pollution so long as the earth itself is healthy. The ecosystem can be seen as a massive engine for processing that pollution. And it does a good job under normal circumstances. But humans are simultaneously destroying its ability to cope while piling in the pollution. This motion is about giving intent about this city's views on fracking and the government's attitude to local democracy. It allows us to look at the planning policies for the future and put in the reviews accordingly. The Lib Dem amendment does not. It simply wants to add in more politicians, more cabinet structures, similar to how they want to go back to a committee system and spend tens of thousands of pounds on that. That does not deliver the green agenda. The reality is we are not the desolate north. We're not some district in a dystopian novel where we produce the resources so the capital can live. I call on this council to support this motion, not just for the environment, but all our people of Newcastle, our children, our grandchildren, and for the future. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. <laughs> Councillor Sutcliffe. Thank you. And we have the amendment. Um, Councillor Kane, are you? Um, or is it Councillor Taylor? Yes. And seconded is Councillor Kane. Okay. Well, that was quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lord, Lord Mayor, I certainly don't support the view of UKIP and many Tories that uh, shale gas is the answer to all our problems um, and that this will in, uh, provide uh, an inexhaustible supply of gas for this country and allow the Tories to get away with stopping all these horrible wind turbines that disturb their views. But neither do I accept the view that fracking will lead to floods, earthquakes, pollution, devastation and probably the appearance of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's really not quite that simple. I don't really understand the... Uh, reference to coal in this motion. I mean, obviously, we have to celebrate the, the heritage of coal in this region, but if you look at the health costs, the deaths, the injuries, the, the, the long-term health problems, um, it's quite clear, let alone the, the greenhouse gas problems, that coal is not a fuel for the 21st century. So why are we even talking about shale gas? Well, we're massively dependent on gas. 
twice as much energy flows through the gas grid as flows through the electricity grid, and that's not counting gas used to generate electricity. And we will not shed this dependence on gas for decades, if ever. And it might be fine being on the end of a gas pipeline from Norway, but being on the end of a procession of liquefied natural gas tankers coming from Qatar isn't actually so good. It's vulnerable to any kind of disruption in a very politically volatile part of the world. From a position of being largely self-sufficient in gas at the turn of the century, with the decline of North Sea gas production in the, U the UK faces the prospect of importing over half its gas needs by the end of this decade. It's right to be very cautious about the potential of shale gas production in this country, but I believe we should be open to exploring at least what the potential is, as long as concerns about the impact on the environment, water pollution, seismic activity, and the impact on greenhouse gas emissions can be satisfactorily dealt with. The concerns about water pollution and earth tremors were looked at in detail by the Royal Society and Royal Academy of Engineering in 2012 at the request of the Liberal Democrat Secretary of State, and they concluded that with appropriate regulation there were no reasons why these concerns should materialise. And in accepting that report, Ed Davey made it perfectly clear that shale gas exploration could only proceed on a cautious basis with those protections and regulations in place. <coughs> Of course, many local communities have genuine concerns about the environmental and visual impact of shale gas exploration in their areas, and that's why it's important that planning decisions for shale gas exploration and production are made by local authorities, just as they are for other forms of energy generation, such as onshore wind. And Liberal Democrats in government have been in pain to assure that as far as practical, similar, view, similar rules on planning and community benefit apply to shale gas as they do for other energy. And I have to say that allowing companies to install pipes to transport the gas under private land without fear of breaking trespass laws doesn't seem to me totally unreasonable. The fact is we just don't know what the potential for shale gas production is in this country. It's much deeper and more difficult to extract than it is in, in uh, America. And certainly some experts believe that there will never be a viable option for shale gas. But we won't know unless we try to find out. But even if we do the exploration, Shale gas will not produce an, uh, a significant amount of gas in this decade, and probably none in the Northeast. So the debate about shale gas is actually irrelevant to our urgent need to invest in low carbon electricity generation to meet our renewable energy targets for 2020, and also our need to reduce energy demand by improving energy efficiency, and that's where the Council's focus should be. And to try and uh, perhaps demonstrate that commitment of the Council. We think the Council should reinstate the environment and sustainability as one of the Council's key objectives and re-establish a Cabinet post to, to drive this forward. Uh, Lord Mayor, there's a lot of, that can be done with uh, renewable energy. Just three weeks ago, uh, a, a, a wonderful target was reached, a, a new record. Wind turbines in the UK, both onshore and offshore, produced 22% of the UK's electricity that day. That's a huge step forward. And wind power has to be one of the main uh, areas that we move on. But we've got lots of other things, marine, tidal, solar, geothermal energy, all of which are probably a lot more important than shale gas. But my feeling is we can't just simply ignore this option. We have to cautiously move ahead and see whether this would provide something that could be useful for future, um, not, uh, of course, instead of renewables. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. I would like to raise the point of order. Uh, Standard Order 14E clearly states that no motion or amendment can be put which increases the expenditure of the Council. I therefore believe that this motion, or oh, this amendment, is out of order. Thank you, Councillor. I can't take legal advice.
As I still were trying to get to the bottom of this, I mean, uh, Chief Whips, are you, are you keeping a uh, record of the time? We're getting near the guillotine. Lord Mayor, is it okay if I address? Yes, please, legal. Yes. Um, having looked at Standing Order 14A, it does say that any notice of motion which would have the effect of materially increasing the expenditure of the Council or reducing the Council revenue should be referred to the Cabinet for consideration. And I think, as one member has already commented, uh, there is that qualification of saying a material increase. <coughs> and so on that basis... Area. I, think, Properly. I, I think Lord Mayor, it's obviously, Lord, sorry, Lord Mayor, I was asked to provide some guidance on the interpretation of the standing orders and the guidance I would give is that I would not regard that as a material increase in the expenditure of the Council. So on that basis I would not suggest that the motion, or sorry, the amendment is out of order. Okay, I've taken lead advice, we will proceed. Councillor Cook, would, did, you, did, you, did you want to make an announcement, yeah? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, he's entitled to make, he's entitled to make a, a, a comment. He's entitled to make an inquiry. Councillor yeah. O'Brien. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, quite disappointed that the amended amendment isn't an improvement um, and you still have the first amendment you placed was flawed and the second one is has the same flaw and it's in the uh, <coughs> section mark council believes that the debate about shale gas should not distract us from the urgent need to invest in low carbon uh, energy electricity generation system well I'm afraid that's exactly what has happened there has been a sort of retreat, almost. There's been hardly any consideration given by the coalition government on investing in renewables. We're way behind our targets. We will never, oh, to be quiet, will you please? Uh, we will never, ever catch up with our European colleagues because we simply haven't taken this issue seriously. We've used everything we can to distract attention from the urgent need to completely rebuild the energy system around alternative sources such as solar, wind and so on. It's quite ironic that the UK has one of the richest wind energy resources in the whole of Europe and yet doesn't really generate as much power as, say, as makes much investment as countries such as Denmark and Germany. This is a real problem. We've even got enough solar power to actually generate quite a bit of our energy in, in, in this country as well. I mean, I in my own house I have a little solar hot water heater. That works very well. I have an air source heat pump. That works very well. But also what I do have is a very thermally efficient house. We have in this country some of the worst thermal efficient buildings in the whole of Europe. It's a damn disgrace. And what did the coalition do, which you supported, which was draw the code for sustainable homes, which would have built new build from 2016 up to the passive house standards. And you supported that. The Green Deal is an absolute nonsense. The current coalition has backtracked on the feed-in tariff. They've done nothing really at all to say that they, they are green. I mean, I remember Cameron and his, with his husky and his hoodie saying we'd be the new Green Conservative Party, the new Green, uh, Conservative, the new green Coalition. You've been anything but. Fracking is a distraction. 
It drains investment away from research and development. We need an alternatives, and we need those urgently. If we are to avoid a more than two degrees centigrade increase in global average temperature, we really need to get cracking right now. Thank you, Councillor Brian. Councillor Cook. I'd like to say a few words not about what we shouldn't be doing but what we, we should. I'm one of those antediluvian people who can remember 30 years ago that quaintly named organisation, the National Coal Board, used to place adverts in the newspapers pointing out that there were two to three hundred years of coal reserves in this country. And of course there still are. 75% of the coal we had uh, is still in the ground. Uh, in the UK and worldwide there is more than that. The reality is that in, on a worldwide basis, there are 500 years of coal reserves available. Contrast that against gas and oil, which is about 50 or 70 years, we're already seeing the rundown of that. Uranium, about 50 years of it left. The reality is that under the present state of knowledge, coal is the only conceivable fuel that can fill the gap we're about to meet until, in the present state of knowledge, we learn to uh, 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 exploit the energy of the sun, the wind, uh, and other forms of energy. I speak as someone who has photovoltaic panels on my own house. But the reality is that there is simply not enough power available in renewables under the present state of, of knowledge to meet the world's energy needs, and coal is going to be needed in a big way. But it isn't going to be deep mined, as, uh, as uh, Councillor Taylor uh, mentioned. The way to extract it in the future is by a technology known as underground coal gasification and carbon capture technology, in which the northeast of England has both the resources and the expertise to do this. We have the coal reserves that are already under land, and huge coal reserves actually under the North Sea, which are proposed to be exploited. I understand, incidentally, that there are also huge coal reserves in rural Oxfordshire, and I hope I'm around when that particular bonfire starts. <laughs> um, so, this is a technology that we need to encourage in the North East. We need to see it going, and I would like to see that included in this letter to the Secretary of State. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Ashby. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And thank you, indeed, uh, Councillor Cook, for, for that contribution. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I heard a presentation by the University of Strathclyde describing exactly this technology uh, and taking uh, the, uh, the, the, the exhaust from power stations and pumping it back down under the ground and bringing back up again gas that could be used. Uh, and I'm not aware that that has progressed very, very, very far, but it was, that was... Uh, uh, thank, thank you for, for reminding us of that. Um, <coughs> As this notes, there's only 250. Sorry, there has been around 250 exploratory licences uh, granted for, for shale gas uh, in the UK. And, and in a report published by the, by the House of Commons, I've examined this, and I've been unable to find any in Tyne and Weir, and indeed none north of the River Tees. So this is this is a pretty academic sort of, uh, of motion that we're starting with. But what's not academic uh, is the the, uh, the a real threat to electricity supplies to our homes and to the people of Newcastle upon Tyne as the power stations, the, our older power stations, start to close down, including the nuclear ones, uh, and we become more and more dependent upon imported gas. As the Germans are finding, uh, President Putin has got his foot on the pipeline that comes in supplying them. We are becoming increasingly dependent on gas, liquefied gas, being imported from Qatar, and it is estimated in a few years' time there will be one gas tanker every 200 miles between here and there, and we have no Royal Navy to protect them, and the record of Qatar uh, as a, uh, not just its dodgy uh, practices for getting World Cups, uh, but also for its funding um, of jihadist terrorists in the Middle East. Uh, is not something that encourages me. And therefore, I'm very much of the opinion that we do have a, a, an urgent problem and that we do have technology that already exists. 
uh, in uh, for low carbon uh, electricity generation. Uh, it, it is not necessarily uh, as efficient as we might like. Uh, I, I, like council over there, uh, have the photovoltaic on, on top of my property, and I sat in the sun, stood in the sunshine the other day and watched the, the meter ticking over and saying, "Ah, all of these photovoltaic cells are generating enough electricity to boil one kettle of water while the sun is shining." Uh, we do have to get into offshore uh, wind generation, and we have here in the North East uh, Centre dedicated to that technology, and that is the kind of thing that we really do need to, to be supporting. So, uh, co coal, uh, coal uh, is best kept un under the ground. I declare an interest. My grandpa Bill was a pitman in, in County Durham, uh, and the legacy that we have from there uh, is, was 1,500 men and boys killed in the 19th century Death and destruction, mayhem and widowhood being created right up to the Easington pit disaster of 1951. Uh, what we have done broadly is that we have exported those dangers uh, to, to overseas where health and safety standards are not what they, what they are here, uh, or we are relying on open cast mining here in the UK, neither of which I find appealing prospects. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fairley. Um, it's, it's not often that I speak in full council, but it's not often as a subject comes up that I feel I can speak with some authority. As a professional physicist, I feel a sort of obligation and a duty to try and uh, sort of fill in some of the background to, to this debate. Um, yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you get gas out the ground? Well, well, normally you drill a hole and it comes out by its own pressure. And uh, after a bit, the pressure drops, you need to give a bit of helping hand, and you pump it out. And I suppose the next stage is, uh, is, is just fracking. You, you actually have to hydraulically fracture the rock to create some fissures and cracks to help the, uh, to help the gas come out. It, it's not that huge a, a leap in technology, really. Um, in this country, the shale beds are extremely deep, um, often several... Uh, thousand meters. Now, we compare that with the coal seams under my house in Newcastle, about 300 feet. Um, that's not caused a problem in my house. Um, 3,000 meters is a long way. I, I, I saw a demonstration from a, a, a professor from Durham whose name escapes me. He said, if that's your ground level here, and this is the water table, and the, uh, the shale beds are down here. Uh, the, certainly in this country, I can't speak for America, but certainly in this country, they're a long way apart. Um, if you're going to burn hydrocarbons, fossil fuels if you like, it's, it's actually uh, the, the um, methane, uh, natural gas, contains the lowest ratio of carbon to hydrogen of any fossil fuel. So it's, it's a bit of an irony really that, uh, that you produce less CO2 burning methane than, than anything else really. And over the last few years, uh, by switching our electricity generation to gas, the dash to gas has helped us actually reduce our CO2 emissions compared to, to burning coal. And um, in the UK, we've invested billions and billions of pounds in infrastructure for uh, distributing gas. It's a very popular fuel. Um, I would guess that the majority of us have gas central heating at home. I, I know I do. It works very well, and I'm very happy with it. And even today, I got a very helpful phone call from somebody suggesting that I hadn't claimed my free gas boiler from, uh, <laughs> from the government, but I, I'll, I'll turn that one down. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, as has been said, we're no longer self-sufficient natural gas. We have to import it often from politically unstable parts of the world. And I don't know about you, but it makes sense that if we've got our own gas here in the UK uh, with British workers to extract it, then it's an opportunity you should take the most of. Um, engineering skills for fracking, sort of skills that we have in the northeast, pipes, pumps, metal fabrication, I thought it was the sort of technology we were supposed to be developing. But then I would like to see us invest in a range of energy technologies. Everyone has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, my personal preference, I'd like to see more nuclear power. I'd like to see hydrogen powered cars. I think electric cars are a bit of a technological dead end. Uh, I'd like to see us be a bit more ambitious on that. Uh, and lastly, on renewables, you can chuck as much money as you like trying to find the solution to a problem, but if you're searching for something that doesn't exist, then you're onto a hiding for nothing. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Power stations don't make energy. They just harvest it from the atmosphere, from the environment around us. Uh, and I'm sorry to be negative, um, but 
to wind up to say it's a fact that you can have as many wind turbines as you like, but like if it was like yesterday and it's not windy, you're wasting your time and solar panels don't work at night. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. This, is, this has become a fascinating debate, isn't it? Just, Councillor Faulkner. <coughs> Councillor Faulkner, no. Councillor Salidas. Councillor Salidas, did you indicate you want to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's quite clear that there's uh, uh, members on the opposite uh, side of the chamber who have different views to this uh, motion that their, their own side is proposing. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, this is far too important to debate to, to, to have canned motions that have quite clearly been brought in for, you know, from some campaigning organisation to be dropped into council agendas when they're actually being proposed by people who don't actually understand what they're talking about. It was quite clear Councillor Bartlett didn't understand uh, what he was talking about on many aspects of that. Um, you know, I, I think we need a little bit of rationality here. Uh, we need to have something where, you know, we're cautious, we're careful, uh, where, you know, this the amendment that's been proposed by Councillor Taylor is actually not that different from the motion that's been proposed, except that Councillor Bartlett is a stonewall, uh, you know, imported uh, motion from somewhere else, uh, saying no, 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 evil coalition, no, no, no. Ours is saying caution, uh, it's saying, uh, you know, bring, uh, maintain democratic control over the process. Uh, and many people in this chamber would, uh, uh, through the planning process, probably oppose fracking through the planning process uh, if, if any applications came to Newcastle. We have to recognize that, um, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Councillor Fairley said, um, there is a need to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, reduce dependence on dictators for our energy, uh, which is very, uh, seeing what happened with, with a fuel protest uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago, I mean, all it took was a bunch of, a couple of hundred protesters around the country and the, and the entire country was virtually brought to its knees. What would happen if Vladimir Putin turned the, turned the taps off this winter? Our, our country would just be devastated and he could do it tomorrow. You know, this is, this is an important issue that has to be dealt with through rational debate. Our motion uh, does that uh, in, by proposing many safeguards, by proposing, uh, which didn't appear in the imported motion of Councillor Bartlett, uh, by proposing um, uh, a strong emphasis on renewable energy, which has to be the long-term future, which I was really disappointed wasn't in the motion. Uh, and uh, uh, to be honest, I think we, you know, the members opposite, uh, we could actually have a bit of cross-party cross, uh, uh, collaboration on this and actually say, well, <coughs> let's support the amendment this time. It's actually very similar to yours. It's proposing great caution about, uh, about fracking. It's not saying stonewalling no, but it's great caution. Uh, and let's um, uh, have some rationality on this debate because I know that I want my lights to stay on uh, this winter. I know I want my kids to have heating this winter and not to be depending uh, on, on a, uh, dictators and, and uh, as Councillor Ashby said, unstable, uh, 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 you know, terrorist supporting regimes in the Middle East for my uh, uh, countries and my family's energy, uh, whilst at the same time strongly supporting uh, moves as soon as possible to renewable energy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Kane. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there's two reasons why I can't support uh, Councillor Bartlett's uh, amendment. First is I've spent, uh, sorry, motion, motion. It's been a long night. Uh, it hasn't been. Uh, the, uh, the first is that I've wasted far too much of my life uh, debating climate change with climate change deniers. And you soon realize that it's a dogmatic position and it doesn't matter how much overwhelming evidence you present to them and peer-reviewed literature and all the rest of it, they'll never accept it and they'll clutch at these little straws around, uh, you know, cherry-pick data and all the rest of it to try and uh, disrupt climate change. If you then go to the other extreme and say, you know, fracking's evil, bio uh, biofuels are evil, carbon offsetting's evil, and all these absolute <laughs> positions, without looking at the evidence, you're just as bad as those climate change deniers in a way. And there's a, I suppose, a, a new movement emerging from the sort of green sustainability, which is based on rationality and pragmatism. We do what works 
and we don't get bogged down in sort of green political baggage. And that is working very well. You know, um, the, just to correct uh, Councillor O'Brien, on the average investment renewables last four years, the last government was three billion pounds. Uh, last year it was seven billion. Sorry, year before last it was seven billion pounds. This year it's eight billion pounds. It is ramping up. We're seeing a renewables revolution, and I'm a lot more enthusiastic about that than than some of the other speakers. I'm much more sceptical about uh, carbon capture and storage. But those are all relative decisions you have to make, and there's no need, there's no point in just rationally drawing lines in the sand, saying this is good, this is bad, and all the rest of it. The second reason why I can't support the original motion is because this council and this city used to have a very hard win one reputation for being one of the most sustainable in the country. And that reputation has been allowed to wither on the vine under the current administration. We've seen a complete erosion down to this vague talk of green threads. As I've said before, almost imperceptible green threads. You have to look very close to find it. So I, think, I believe very strongly in getting our own house in order before we point a finger and tell the government what to do. So those are the two reasons, Lord Mayor, that I, what, I'm no great fan of fracking, I should add, on the end, but that I think we should support the amendment and not the original motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sutcliffe. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm delighted to second this motion. And I'd like to share with the Chamber an inspiring thing I saw when I was in California a couple of months ago. We were visiting the San Jacinto, I think I'm pronouncing that right, National Wilderness, and I'd just taken a cable car, very high and terrifying, up a mountain that overlooks where the San Andreas Fault runs through the valley that has Palm Springs in it. This valley is very wide, miles across, and as we looked down, we could see a lot of tiny white towers in rows across this valley. A valley wide enough that a small city covers only about half of it, and as we really looked, it was possible to tell what they were. They were wind turbines, hundreds upon hundreds of wind turbines stretching across miles and miles of this valley. I've never seen so many wind turbines in one place in my entire life. Now, the US is a big country, and I know here we don't physically have room for the area the size of Wensleydale covered in wind turbines, or a solar farm the size of a small town, like I saw there. But that doesn't mean we can't be ambitious about our renewables. We are only, still, despite recent peaks, generating about 12% of our energy this way. Uh, whilst in Germany they generated a third of their energy from renewables in the first half of 2014, and one Sunday in May it was 74%. 350,000 roofs in Queensland, Australia, where admittedly there is more sun, are generating one over 1,000 megawatts and dropping the wholesale price of energy to nothing during the peak hours of daytime. Are we so unambitious that we can't do better with our country surrounded by sea and full of wind and rivers? Can't we move away from the old fallback of digging power out of the ground and burning it? It served its purpose, but it had terrible prices, and now those who cling to it, like a safe warm blanket, I feel really need to move on. While we're in the US, yes, still banging on about this, sorry, I caught the tail end of the entertainingly named and thankfully less harmful tropical storm, Boris. Boris wasn't too bad, but we all remember the devastation wreaked by Hurricane Katrina, and in New York, there is still a subway line closed due to the damage from Hurricane Sandy. Back home in my own ward, like I'm sure so many of yours, we've been patching up the damage caused by Thunder Thursday. According to the best predictions we have, there will be more of this, and it will not be cheap to deal with, or a positive influence on anyone's economy. Climate change is not going away, and the more CO2 we add into the atmosphere, whether it's one molecule from shell gas methane, or two from ethanol, fueling ethanol-fueled cars, or many from burning coal, the more the ice caps melt, and the worse things will get. It's time to get real, to be ambitious and brave, and to take a stand. Time to tell the country and the world that Newcastle says we will not be taking the easy way out. That smogs, extinctions, flooding, acidified oceans, earthquakes, no matter how tiny they are on the Richter scale, and tap water you can set fire to, no matter how low the odds are of the shafts breaching and pumping methane and gallons of hydrochloric acid detergent into our aquifers, no matter, sorry Steve, how high they are above the level of the fracking going on, are not an acceptable risk. When there are perfectly functional alternatives, as has been shown in Europe and elsewhere, they would be a high risk even if there were no alternatives. <coughs> this government has kept the North East in recession, saving any recovery for the rich, and inflating a new housing bubble in the South. But despite their savage cuts to the sort of core cities, crippling the infrastructure and holding back autonomy from the places which could be economic powerhouses fueling the recovery, we can still encourage green business to come to Newcastle. We can seek to build our houses with new 
uh, solar panels for roofs and with decent insulation, if councils are ever allowed to build a decent amount of houses again. We should write into our planning policy that we will oppose applications for fracking in our authority and encourage green energy applications. Let's face it, fossil fuels are last century's power source and it's time to move on to the future. Thank you, Councillor Sutcliffe. You see, patience is a virtue. She was finishing, I knew she was. Councillor Bartlett. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, on this side of the chamber, we allow our members to actually make across their, their views. And uh, not, not like on your side. So having a go, having a go at Councillor Fairley in his physics way, um, as he does... And then we've got Councillor Sutcliffe, who then makes the strong point afterwards. Um, Councillor Cedis, the reality of this motion is that it's a motion that comes from me, comes from other people, but it's not sort of doctored and comes in, written by others. I sat down and wrote it. I brought it to Labour Group. We agreed it. We saw this as something that we believe in on this side of the chamber. Clearly, you don't. Clearly, you support fracking. Clearly, you don't support local democracy. What you want to see is an erosion of our rights. You want to see that you, your government, that you support, is bringing in the Growth and Infrastructure Bill, which will undermine the planning process, which will undermine our rights as local citizens. That is what you want. And when the towers get built in other parts of this country, we say in Newcastle, we support everywhere in this, city, in this country. We support them. We don't want it here. And that's how we want it to be. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Council to vote on the amendment. <coughs> May vote. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Ring the bell. Yes, I think it went out. There we are. So this, the amendment. The amendment falls. So. Council to vote on the substantive motion. <coughs> and that's carried. I thought it was a very interesting debate. I mean, I've been educated tonight. Academics. The guillotine has fallen. Councillor Dunn, do you want your item to be dealt with now and put to the vote without discussion, or do you want it to be postponed to the next meeting? debate but I do not accept the amendment which is completely negative and uh, lacks any coherence lacks any coherence with the original okay. yeah okay so we, we, we need to move we need to move the motion and have a second <coughs> so who have we got Right, thank you, Councillor Stone. Do we have a second there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we come, we vote on the amendment.
<coughs> the amendment falls, therefore we will we'll vote on the substantive motion. And the motion is carried. And that concludes tonight's business. Thank you very much. It's been a long night. <laughs> we didn't get our protesters. Anyway.